Catering Depot is a provider of quality modern commercial kitchen and food service equipment. With over 20 years of experience in business and partnerships with various quality brands spanning all over the world to provide the right equipment suited for today's modern chef. Brands such as Breville Polyscience, Roboku, Cooktech, Unox, Vito, Hoshizaki, Santos, Newmacher, Osti, Excalibur, and many more. So whether you are looking for a piece of equipment to start your food business or restaurant, contact us for a quotation and we'll be happy to assist you. Because at Catering Depot, we provide modern equipment for today's modern chef. The key to success is understanding the subtleties of flavor. After all, flavors make the dish. From the tiniest pinch to the most generous dash, mastering it is what separates great cooking from good. It is also what separates McCormick from the rest. Ours is a mastery that the world can taste and experience. A mastery that empowers you in your culinary creations. With McCormick, you can wield the power of flavors like an expert. Experiment with a blend of earthy spices and savory meat broth. Marry the flavors over robust spices and aromatic herbs in a warm and hearty meal. Harness the explosive goodness of salty, tangy flavor bombs. Use warm, bold spices and herbs to add the unexpected to the familiar and awaken the senses with refreshing tropical fruity concoctions blooming with spices and herbs. Everything you need to create tomorrow's culinary masterpieces. Everything you need to always be plates ahead. McCormick.
Good morning, everyone. And I would like to greet CCA Manila a happy 25th birthday. And I'd like to thank everyone here who made the time to be with us this morning. So before we will start shortly in a few minutes, um, we will go ahead with the Invocation National Anthem and of course, just a short uh, AVP on our 25 milestones. So just grab a coffee or your breakfast and hopefully you'll enjoy the session today. Let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we offer you our thanksgiving. We thank you for everyone gathered here today to walk with you. May we ask you for your blessings and guidance so that the activities set for this undertaking be successful. We ask you to open our eyes to see the wonderful things from this activity. We ask that you open our ears so that we may retain the invaluable knowledge. Open our minds for us to think wisely. Put us with understanding, cooperation, and peace in fulfilling our responsibilities. Open our hearts so that we may receive your everlasting love. And open our spirit so that we may know that you are with us all throughout the day. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Again, happy 25th to CCA Manila. So I am actually Bea from um, the PR and Communications Department of CCA Manila. And I am joined with my favorite co-host. I don't know if he's here. Good Chef morning Alex. to everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. How are you? I'm very, very good. And you? you wanna... How are you? Good, good. Do you want to let everyone know who you are? Where I think we have a lot of new uh, names here. In our Zoom room. Okay, my name is Philip John Golding. I'm the culinary director for CCA. I've been with the school on and off for almost 20 something years, 25 years, I guess. And um, uh, yes, just a great morning to you all, and thank you for joining. 
Yeah, Chef Philip, you are one of the landmark landmark of CCA Manila, right? You you taught a lot of the first batch, <laughs> and you you know what it was like with butchery, and now you get to do uh, a lot of you know bring in partners with us. So I am grateful that you're joined me as a co-host today. So everyone will get started as I know everyone here is excited to hear from our speakers. I would like to remind all of you that we are actually live on Facebook. So most people are in the Zoom room, but if you would like to share and people who didn't get to uh, catch up in registration, feel free to share and start a watch party. Again, all registered participants shall receive a silver lining kit. A silver lining kit includes access to the four day virtual events, as well as a copy of our digital cookbook of 25 um, recipes. You'll love this. I saw like calamansi cake. I saw a lot of different kind. I saw some adobo as well, of course, you can't lose that. And then, you will also get a copy of recipes from our alumni cook-off, which is happening next week, and 25 ebooks from our e-library and a webinar certificate for all the events. Um, again, the silver lining kit and digital cookbook shall be released seven days after the week-long celebration. So we'll get the admin out of the way and I will read, we don't really like rules, but I'll, I'll go through this um, just to make sure everyone has a great experience. Um, my, it's not here, but uh, be, please feel free to greet everyone. Good morning. It's a uh, early morning for some and some people different time zones um, just say hello so the first thing is to ensure the quality of video and audio we have muted all participants um, except our speakers so you can just check the microphone it has a uh, x and it's red that means you're on mute do you if you have a question use our chat box and you can also unmute yourself or you know we'd love to bring you i love when people jump on the virtual floor and ask questions you can also tag us at cca manila hashtag cca 25 anniversary on facebook and instagram because we are celebrating it with all of you and lastly, we value time. We will keep this within the allotted time, but usually it goes over time a little bit, but hopefully you will enjoy and you'll learn a lot from the day because our speakers are amazing and they all come from different, um, how do you say this, different, they've chosen different channels and how to storytell th through food. So I'm very, very excited. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Shafi. Okay, so I'd like to acknowledge some people here. So I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, our CCA employees, our students, um, our ad board, our CCA institutional partners, um, our anniversary sponsors for the four-day event. I'd like to welcome our speakers and uh, non-CCA students, employees from private and public sectors, individual business owners, and all culinary and baking enthusiasts, enthusiasts watching us. So a happy Thanksgiving and good morning to you all. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving. You know what, Jeff, besides the roster of uh, participants that you've said, it's always nice to look through the Zoom room and see uh, people that have been with CCA a long way back or, you know, they're still there supporting us. So thank you so much for joining us. If your camera's not on and you've been part of a CCA journey, feel free to send a message on the chat box so we can acknowledge you. I, I see Chef Ben always active and um, always the most enthusiastic Zoom participant. Um, okay, so we have, uh, it's our celebrations. Hi, Third Banyo, how are you? Um, so we are actually going to be celebrating from November to December, but it's really a week long celebration. So last week we had a kickoff. Um, this week we have a talk on storytelling through food. Next week we have, um, we have a clash of plans as well as alumni uh, um, cook-off. So we see some of our alumni share some amazing recipes around Filipino food. We also had a CCA employees gathering yesterday. And lastly is the digital cookbook and alumni um, get together. So this is one week um, spread out as we know there is such a thing as Zoom fatigue. So yeah. Um, hopefully you will join us in most of these days. And if not, there are recordings that you can catch up. 
Um, okay, just to recap, uh, I know everyone's waiting for our speakers. On day one, we had amazing, big push, I think, Chef Philip, on so much to do. Two things that I remembered from last week. We have to make Filipino cuisine sexy. I don't know how, I think there's many ways to do that. Food is sexy. And number two, um, there's a lot to do with the schools and starting um, our, you know, Filipinos early in appreciating ingredients from different regions. So we had Angela Comsti uh, co-hosted with me, as well as Dr. Mike Tan and Iger Ramos and Congressman um, Toff Devanesha spoke and shared some of their thoughts. Um, so yeah, that was an uh, amazing um, kickoff event and uh, just gave us a push that we have to do a lot of things. Okay, so today is really one of my favorite uh, activities, which is storytelling through writing, speaking, and so much. And one of my favorite uh, ways to storytell is not just through words, but through food. So we will hear from a lot of people today on how that has, you know, really, um, it's not just something we eat. It's not something we do just to survive. There's so many ways to get to know food um, and our culture through something we eat, something we share. So very, very excited for today. So just to uh, give everyone an overview on who will be speaking. Yes, so we have um, different topics today from sustaining cravings for Filipino food, storytelling through chocolate, storytelling through Filipino cuisine advocacy, and start telling through hotel setting and lastly on creating online content. So there is something here for everyone and hopefully um, you will take down notes and um, be better storytellers, right, Chef Philip? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, yes, quick survey, here we go. So just to wake everybody up. <laughs> we have to, to wake them up, uh, yeah. Yeah, wakey, wakey. So what is your favorite regional ingredient? Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. So what is your favorite regional ingredient? So we take a quick survey. Yeah, go say something on the chat box. What, what is your favorite Filipino? Chef Philip. Oh, I see one oh. there. <laughs> Good already from Rachel. I see calamansi. I see so. I see coconut yeah. cream. Ooh, I knew yeah. the coconut was coming. That's great. Awesome. Yeah. Brilliant. I saw okay. a really black salt yesterday. Someone posted it. I cannot remember where it comes from the Philippines, but it looked very... Yeah, curing, and brine, curing and brining is all the big, big rave now. It's coming back. It's been there before, but it's being more mm -hmm. highlighted. So salt is uh, used to be an extremely precious ingredient. And now it's coming back again in all different forms. So wonderful. Okay, so we One. will... A Twitter, okay. Oh, okay, everyone. Is dang bagoong? <laughs> Hello, Messina. Coconut milk. Wow, La ing, yeah. <laughs> crab garlic. <laughs> Plenty going on there, right? So yeah. fantastic. Oh, they're, they're coming in. Chili, chilies. Wonderful. What's your favorite? I was very, I'm I was, curious. I, I, well, I was super, super lucky yesterday. I, I went to Bel Air and I, and I met this amazing farmer. A shout out to Louis Gutierrez, an amazing individual um, who is part of the urban farmers in, in Manila, believe it of all places. And he, you know, blew my mind with, with a number of uh, herbs that I've never, never heard of. So, you know, at CCA, we're building these courses, obviously, with also Mark Rolden uh, from Lutian mm -hmm. Farms, uh, who has um, an amazing knowledge of herbs and spices as well so we're very lucky and privileged to be working with these um, individuals to uh, strengthen our cuisines so gatron come and see okay so after the survey you know i like um, i'm the same coconut different forms right it's just some of these uh i really like i think i said this the last time pinakarat but uh, coconut sap like from Aligan. i've never been there but i would love to just it's just something that if there's one thing I always have in my pantry, if I want me to remind me of home, it's binokurat, like coconut vinegar. Yes, it is good. <laughs> I love it. Well, fermentation is also the big rave now. So vinegars are uh, essential 
for these fermentations. And uh, it was amazing at the um, speech, speech the other day, the conference of the CCA of how uh, all these ingredients and heirloom ingredients and recipes are now surfacing again, uh, well deserved to uh, inspire the next generation. Uh, obviously, relying on the history of the past, where sometimes in between you lose the essence of these um, beautiful recipes. But it's, I'm glad to see a huge movement to bring these ingredients to the table again and to rethink and to uh, represent mm. banana vinegar. Banana vinegar. Okay. Oh, I've never had mm. that. Interesting. Where can we get this? Um, okay, let's get started. As I know, everyone is waiting for our speakers, not just us talking about ingredients, Chef Philip. So go ahead, yes. Chef. Okay, so I'm very excited to introduce to you my dear colleague and friend at CCA, our very own Chancellor for Education, Dr. Virtus Luna. Among many accolades of Dr. Luna, one I am very fond of and very proud of is her recent recognition for her outstanding work towards nutrition and diets by a leading authority in the Philippines. A warm welcome to our dear Dr. Luna. Good morning, Dr. Luna. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Chef Philip. Hi, Bea. I'm so happy to be here. And I see we are more than 100. Exciting. So welcome to day two. And I think you already um, told everybody about what happened on the first day you know, with uh, Toff, Congressman Toff, and all the other speakers. So wonderful. So welcome to day two. And uh, this is our two the second day of our two week long CCA at 25 celebration event. Happy anniversary to everyone. So uh, why are we here today? Storytelling, why, why storytelling? So we wanted to showcase the power of food in trying to connect people and telling their stories and talking about their culture. So we understand that food is a great platform to share about one's culture. No? And uh, telling our stories through food can certainly uncover many things, many things about ourselves, our culture, which we often think as common. No? We think that um, uh, dipping uh, food in vinegar is common to all, but actually these things is uh, quite unique. And this is what makes us unique as a people. So uh, storytelling is also very, in I would say, in a fun way, no? cannot be undermined because it is a way of passing on information to other people. And um, often it is packed with emotions, self-discoveries, and even uh, social, social psychological underpinnings. And we hope that these stories do not remain um, told orally or verbally, but likewise to be documented, either documented through books, publications, or through research, you know, so that we are able to contribute to the invaluable stock of knowledge about our gastronomy. So today we have invited a lot of speakers who will share a lot of their stories. So of course, we have Nicole Ponseca, Andre Pinay, so we have Grace Quinto and uh, Fide Santos Argelias, Miss Nicey of Aura Chocolates. Of course, we have Chef Jello Gison and Chef John Buenaventura. So we look forward to listening to their stories. No? In Filipinos, yung storytelling, pagkukwento. No? So in uh, today's layman's term, uh, they say, okay, may kukwento ako sa'yo, I'm going to tell you a story. But actually, it's more of chismis. No? Mahilig ang Filipinos sa chismis. But we hope that we're able to elevate this and able to really document this. No? So I look forward to listening to their stories. I hope you are also looking forward to their story. So thank you for joining us today and please enjoy our session. So magandang umaga po, magandang hapon, and uh, magandang gabi sa lahat. And uh, welcome to our session today. Thank you. Back to you, Chef Philip and Ms. Bea. Okay, thank you. Bea. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tara, um, for opening our, um, our talks today. Uh, we will start off with uh, with a group or a female-led cultural advocacy group working together to bring Filipino cuisine, culture, and community to the hearts and minds and taste buds of Australians. So, Chef Philip, I you know how much I love um, Australia. So we'll start off um, with Andrew Penais. If we can just move on to the next slides. Um, 
So Chef Philip, you know, Filipino cuisine is, is almost everywhere. Like you can see a lot of people um, promoting it. And I think a big part of that in Australia is Enterprise. They really do show a lot of our food across Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao. And what I love about them is they communicate in a way in a global and local sense. Um, there's a lot of meaningful change and innovative opportunities when it comes to Filipino cuisine. And their work has really been highlighted in Melbourne Food and Wine Festival, ABC, Gourmet Traveler, Frankie Magazine, SBS Food, The Age, Herald Sun, uh, Cebu Pacific Air, Philippine Airlines, Philippine government, and so much more. So they, you know, Chef Philip, when we introduce Filipino cuisine, the most important thing for foreigners and in a different um, country is really to make it fun, understandable, human, and relatable. And I feel like they do such a good job and at this. So let's just watch their presentation and see what they're up to. When I think of the word barrio, it means to me family, culture, the root of being Filipino, which is togetherness. The idea of through good times and bad times, what we have are each other. All of that, you know, plus I guess what we're doing here for Barrio, a meeting of the mind, shared goal, it's common blood, it's celebration, it's Bainihan, this is the generosity, the hospitality, the camaraderie, the communality, and how we eat. Oh, it's, it's amazing. I'm so proud of uh, what entrepreneurs have done uh, for our culture and furthering uh, our cuisine. Rice and beef with that beautifully made peanut sauce made from scratch is probably my highlight tonight. Absolute honour and privilege to have you guys involved and the Filipino Slaves as part of the 2019 Melbourne Food and Wine Festival. It's nice to see the community come out supporting Barrio. It's just the beginning of more and more and more Filipino events, Filipino themed events. Barrio means uh, train of love. Um, especially through food and family. Food and yeah, the, the core is food. Uh, this experience has been uh, an eye-opener, to be honest, to explore a new culture through their cuisine, their flavors, new ingredients that I never knew, the way of eating, the way of cooking, and also all the beautiful story behind each dish. Tonight has been such a beautiful night to be part of, to share and learn about a culture that is new to me. Each of the dishes has been so gorgeous in terms of ingredients that we haven't experienced. I've had a fantastic dining experience tonight as a Philippine representative of the Philippine government to Australia. And we really very proud to participate in this event. This is really an opportunity for us to promote uh, Philippine cuisine. And I thank the organizers for really highlighting what we Philippines can offer to the world. That was Barrio, the entrepreneur's debut event for Melbourne Food and Wine Festival 2019. It was the largest of its scale in the 26-year history of Australia's internationally acclaimed festival. And its impact was loud and proud, just as we had intended. It introduced the entrepreneurs to Melbourne's food and wine scene and international visitors, as well as audiences around the globe. Barrio launched and reinforced the entrepreneur's purpose and vision. Australia is home to 294,000 people of Filipino heritage, the fifth largest group of Australians born overseas, and the third largest Asian cohort after China and India. Despite being Australia's food capital, Melbourne still lags behind in terms of awareness and experience of Filipino cuisine, culture and community. So the vision for the entrepreneurs is for Filipino culture, cuisine and community to be celebrated, represented and cultivated in Australia and throughout the global diaspora. Kamusta, we're the entrepreneurs, food-loving, enterprising Filipino Australians working together to bring Filipino cuisine, culture and community to the hearts, minds and taste buds of Australians on Wurundjeri country. 
Introducing the team from left to right is Felisa Sepuedes, our community lead, Maisie Lesiones, our vision designer and photographer, myself, Fidesz May Santos Arguelles, and Grace Ginto, co founders and directors, Christina Narai, culinary and hospitality industry lead, and Sandra Tan, our media manager. We are diverse in origin, proudly representing regions across Luz Viminda. And we're also diverse in age, ideas and opinions, lived experiences, careers and capabilities. Our multidisciplinary skills, knowledge and experience in business, marketing, communications, design, events and hospitality, combined with a global and local lens, frames our considered approach to the entrepreneur's advocacy work in moving our cuisine, culture, community and enterprises forward. Our purpose is multifold, to combat any challenges and negative perceptions of our cuisine and culture, to contribute to Melbourne's reputation as a world-class gastronomic destination, to discover or rediscover our Filipino heritage and cement our Australian Filipino identity. We also look to develop, connect and empower a global sisterhood of entrepreneurs and allies. And to lead and voice positive action for change. How do we achieve this? We educate the broader Australian community on the true value of Filipino produce, like calamansi, through the calamansi story. Calamansi, the wonder fruit of the Philippines. Small in size, with its unique aroma and taste that combines the flavour notes of lemon and lime. We love it in traditional and modern Filipino cuisine. And we create content on the way we cook, like our Salog video for Gourmet Traveller. And share the way we eat, like this epic Kamayan feast with 180 community members. A big part of what we do is to create and deliver a curated program of unique experiences to celebrate Filipino heritage through food. And we engage, inspire and grow with a global community of cultural champions. We lead and support advancement efforts for Australian Filipinos in collaboration with leaders and change makers in business, in industry and government. This reminds me of home. True Filipino style. We've got a beautiful chicken. Here's one I prepared earlier. Basically you just throw it in there. That's the colour that you're getting. Welcome to In My Cucina, the Cook and the Chef series. Step into my office here. The entrepreneurs have gathered the barrio to promote the best of Filipino cuisine, culture and community. I think it's perfect. Pour the caramel on top. Beautiful, fresh prawns. Tune in to the entrepreneurs Instagram this November to celebrate some of the best the Philippines has to offer here in Australia. Thanks for watching. What's been the most rewarding part? Well, community and food is at the heart of what we do. It serves as our inspiration and call to action. With Food as a Gateway, we are grateful to be able to connect and engage with a network of talented Filipinos and collaborators of colour in Australia and the global diaspora. And it's truly rewarding to create and collaborate in spaces where we can amplify our voices, share our stories, spark curiosity and conversation, and open hearts, minds and taste buds to discover and rediscover and share our cuisine and culture. And to collectively live out the Bayanihan spirit to empower kind, generous and impactful acts of Balik Bayan for good. That support dreams and livelihoods of our community, both here and in the Philippines. Our purpose-driven online store, Mercado, serves to do just that, a destination where advocacy meets enterprise.
we work to instill pride in our culture and cuisine, dismantling cultural cringe and internalized colonial oppression with our own Filipino communities. Crab mentality is real. For us, however, we view it as an opportunity for open, respectful and constructive discourse, not cancel culture as we see so often on social media. Food is political. How can it not when food inequality is so rampant within our own barrio? And the pandemic only further highlighted this. So we choose to use our platform and voices not only to celebrate food, but to lead and support positive action for change. You can't move forward without acknowledging and learning from the past. And we can only rise when we rise together. So what's our advice for young aspiring chefs who want to promote Filipino cuisine? Yes, please, in big, bold, loud neon lights. Our food has absolutely every right to be on the global table alongside any other cuisine. Even better when bright sparks of Filipino culinary talent, knowledge and passion are at the forefront. It is important that we learn and acknowledge our history and culture, including its regionality, as it connects people and place. It is powerful and it can be part of your story. We hope you do your part to learn deeply about our cuisine from those within our culture who have come before you as you come into your own, as emerging masters of the culinary arts, as culture bearers and future shapers of Filipino cuisine. What will work internationally? Well, there's a global community of cultural and culinary champions out there. And with social media and virtual platforms as powerful tools, and Filipino cuisine and the Bayanihan spirit as your essential ingredients, the world awaits. Seek out mentors, learn, explore, and collaborate. And most importantly, pursue, build, and nurture genuine and meaningful connections. This is where we have truly experienced the magic of Balik Bayan with a shared vision for our cuisine, culture, and community. Would like to end with a quote from our dear friend Nicole Penseca, pioneer and altogether amazing woman and author of Cookbook and Manifesto, I am a Filipino and this is how we cook. I am a Filipino, inheritor of a glorious past, hostage to the uncertain future. As such, I must prove equal to a twofold task, the task of meeting my responsibility to the past and the task of performing my obligation to the future. On behalf of our team, thank you for having the entrepreneurs be part of your 25th anniversary celebrations. Congratulations and marami salamat for your, from your barrio in Australia. Thank you so much. I think we'll hear from them later during the Q&A, I believe. But um, Chef Philip, what did you think? Super inspiring, right? Mm -hmm. And as you can see, if it can be done in Australia, we're more places like my homeland of London, the UK, right, which is a growing Filipino population out there. And uh, just it's so exciting for the Philippines and for to be a chef now or in the industry, right, uh, in the restaurant industry. But um, very well thought through and very well written. And fantastic. Yeah. Very timely. I think one of the my key takeaways from that is take a you know something that we always hear or something humble, whether it's calamansi or barrio and put more depth into it. And I love that last quote about, you know, about the past and the future, but at the same time, you only have now. So for our chefs down there, today is the day and you just have to focus on how you present. And I think last week they were mentioning we should stop serving our food in potluck or in a buffet mm -hmm. style and actually take the time to um, serve it in a way that uh, gives pride to our culture and um, thank you entrepreneurs for doing your part as well and showcasing Filipino cuisine in a fun um, relatable way in Australia um, they're just I don't know amazing storytellers um, so we will move on to our next speaker uh, I will ask May to introduce uh, our next speaker so that we can uh, go from there one of my favorite ingredients chocolate I can't Hi, Ms. Bea. Hi, Chef. Hi. Good morning to the both of you. 
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And of course, to all those who are joining us for this morning and to all our guest speakers, a great morning to all of you. And of course, a happy 25th anniversary once again to CCA Manila. So if I may have the next slide, please. So I'm introducing to you now our second speaker for this morning. We have Ms. Nicey, the sales associate, shall represent Auro Chocolate. Ms. Kelly Go and Mr. Mark Ocampo are the co-founders and managing directors of Auro Chocolate. They are extremely passionate about all things about chocolate. They both grew up in the Philippines and first met in Chicago over a decade ago and instantly bonded over their love for food and culture. Aura Chocolate is an internationally awarded Filipino tree to bar chocolate brand that promotes sustainability by working directly with local farmers to create fine Filipino cacao beans, ingredients, and retail products with unique and bold tropical flavors. Aura represents the pursuit to refine Philippine cacao and elevate the lives of our local farmers and who are as precious as gold. So without further ado, let's all hear it from Ms. Nice. Good day, everyone. Good morning, um, Ms. Vea and hey. Chef Philip. And thank you for the introduction of Aura Chocolate. We are very honored to be part of this. Thank you for inviting Aura Chocolate for the um, 25th anniversary of CCA Manila. Congratulations and happy silver anniversary. We will be sharing a few things about um, chocolate here in the Philippines and how Aura contributes to the storytelling about food when it comes to cacao and chocolate. Aura Chocolate is an internationally awarded tree to bar chocolate brand. Um, as mentioned earlier, Aura is offering um, different products like ingredients as well as chocolate and cacao products. The company was founded in 2015. That is when Aura started um, working on the project to build this brand and the company, and then also working with different farmers to source the cacao here in the Philippines. And then the brand was officially launched in May 2017. And from there on, the company continued to grow. And as a relatively young company, um, which started just in 2017, Oro has already garnered um, 50 plus international awards. And it's such an um, honor to bring the Philippines to the world um, map when it comes to chocolates. And we're looking forward to doing more in the next few years. Um, we also want to share a few milestones about the company. So um, aside from the launch, we also have different collaborations like Philippine Airlines and also different um, partnerships and collaborations with restaurants and other um, Hareka and food industry um, brands. And aside from that, Oro has also received the Halal and HACCP certification, which also um, shows that Oro is also for providing quality ingredients and products, both here in the Philippines and also internationally. And, and um, before the pandemic, during um, the International Cacao Awards in 2019 at Paris, um, Manghases Saguban, one of the partner farmers of Aura Chocolate, um, the cacao beans from his farm in Pakibato, Davao, actually won top 20 best cacao. And it's the very first time that the Philippines has received an award for Cajau such as that. And um, the goal is to continue his legacy even if after he passed away, his family and other farmers in Davao and other regions here in the Philippines are still continuing um, with the cacao farming here in the Philippines. Um, so here we are showing some photos of the partner farmers and also cacao in um, the farm. So we see here a photo of the cacao beans, which are naturally being sun dried. And also, um, we see here that the cacao beans are 
really from the farmers or is actually working directly with different partner farmers. There's, um, the cacao is not being sourced from um, a privately owned um, farm of Oro, but it's actually from different um, farmers in Davao and other locations as well. And the goal is to really help them, to really empower them. And with this, Aura is also doing programs, different programs to train them and also um, teach them how to really grow their farm as a business and also produce quality cacao. And it's Aura's um, pride to really have that special um, program where in cacao receives a premium price for the cacao that they are able to produce as long as it has that higher quality. So from um, 2015 to um, after several years of partnership with Oro, they are able to earn at least double or even more from the cacao beans that are being um, sourced from their farm. Or it's also focusing on bean to bar and actually recently it has trans transitioned to tree to bar and the goal of this is to really show that um, the cacao and the chocolates being produced by Aura is really traceable. It's also single origin um, coming here from the Philippines as mentioned. Or is also sorting, sourcing very um, high quality cacao that is why there's careful classification based on variety. There's also different classifications based on the specific um, single estate source of the cacao beans. And when it comes to ingredients, Aura is using 100% cocoa cacao butter from um, the cacao source here in the Philippines as well. And very simple and honest ingredients. When it comes to flavor and taste profile, we really focus on the different flavor profiles that can be found um, in the different cacao and the farmer income, as mentioned earlier, we try to, to make it really sustainable. There's a lot of programs and the, um, the partnership of Oro with the farmers is really direct and the, there's no middleman. We directly source the cacao from the farmers. And when it comes to the finished product, Aura is very much involved in every single step from the farm. There's a, an Aura team supporting the farmers in, in Davao. And also when it comes to production, Aura also has its own factory, which is located in Laguna. We'd also like to share a little bit of the background of how Aura's um, brand name or uh, name came up. So it's actually a combination of A, which is the chemical symbol for gold, and also the Filipino and Spanish term for gold, which is oro. So it's really focusing on the quality of the chocolates um, produced here from the Philippines. And the goal is to really help elevate the um, chocolate industry from here in the Philippines and to really promote it internationally. And it's actually um, one of the interesting facts that one of the rarest variety, varieties of cow, criollo, can be found here in the Philippines. So in, in such a way, we can say that it's, it's something very precious and um, something that it's very unique to have that here in the Philippines. When it comes to the values of the company, we really focus on transparency and traceability. Everything is single origin. We are able to indicate where the cacao is being sourced. There's innovation as well, helping um, with the farmers improve their farms, farm businesses, and also in the factory. We make sure that there are very um, high quality equipment being used to produce the chocolate products. And then part of the values of Aura is the learning process. There's, con there's continuous um, learning experience. And also there are also, um, it's also part of the founders and owners goal to really learn more about how not just here in the Philippines and also internationally, they, they make sure that there's ample training for everyone from the farm and up to the Aura team. And then we also focus on having that 
um, good environmental impact, making sure that um, Oro's products are really natural and we support the uh, farmers as well when it comes to their their farms and also empowering farmers as we mentioned earlier. Um, some of the challenges that we experience, I think a lot of the food and um, food businesses and um, companies in the food industry was really affected during the pandemic. So these are actually some of the challenges that we encountered, but um, with everyone, we are striving to really overcome it and hopefully soon that we're able to, to really survive this pandemic and go through more projects and um, promote the different products of the Philippines, not only just locally, but also internationally. So what does Oro do when it comes to the brand and also the products we try to adapt? So um, the goal is to really know the, the trends and also um, which ones the it would be applicable for the company or for the brand. But at the same time, it's really not to jump into every single um, trend, not to just join the bandwagon, but make sure that it's aligned with the goals and the, the values of the company. And the goal is to really think out of the box. So, or is continuously innovating and producing different products that are unique and resourceful as well with um, what's available. And then we also try to deliver the best quality ingredients possible and products as well. We'd like to share to you the research collection of Oro. So as mentioned um, earlier, one of the, um, the farmers, the partner farmers of Oro Chocolate, which is Mang Jose Seguban, um, the cacao beans from Pakibato won top 20 best awards. And this is actually one of the products being produced using th those cacao beans. So this is actually a single um, estate uh, chocolate bar, which is 70% dark chocolate. And with the reserve collection, the goal of the brand is to really promote the different um, varieties and different estates of the cacao and also treating it similarly to wine wherein it's also distinguished based on the year of harvest. So depending on the year of harvest, the, the origin, the specific origin and the variety of how we try to the, um, distinguish and differentiate the different um, flavor notes and flavor profiles that can be found in cacao. Aside from um, promoting the brand um, on its own, we also try to do collaborations and different partnerships with different brands, both locally and internationally. And as you can see here, um, there are different partnerships um, with different uh, hotel brands, also restaurants, and also even non-food uh, brands. Oro aims to uh, collaborate with, with different people and companies who would who has the same um, goal of promoting the products here in the Philippines. And as we can see here, there's really a wide range of collabs that or has um, done in the past few years. It's and um, there's some chocolate bars, customized chocolate bars. We also see um, like very unique products as part of the innovation. As you see here, there's a hot chocolate bomb and there's also um, the bar crawl of our chocolate with selected partner restaurants and publish on before the pandemic. So we, we continuously look for um, different brands who would like to collaborate with Aura to really promote the, the products and also what can be produced using local ingredients. Um, to chefs and culinarians, uh, what we can say is that let us all try to um, support local. As we can see here, chocolate is not just for sweet uh, um, dishes. It's not just for desserts, for baking, or not just for drinks. It can also be used for savory dishes. There's so many things. There are so many things that we can um, make using chocolate and cacao, and um, it's just. Um, an honor to see the different products and food that 
different chefs and culinarians has been able to produce over the past years in partnership with Forest Ingredients. And we see here a wide array of different um, dishes that were produced in partnership with with ours in Rita. So we really want to encourage everyone to support local. We we know that um, it's also challenging to, to um, convince some people to, to use local ingredients, but it's not just um, helping the local industry, but also helping the farmers and also um, the food industry here in the Philippines as a whole. So with that, we, we end by saying, um, let's support local. Let's all try to share um, different stories about the food um, that, and ingredients that we source here locally. And um, let's support the local farmers as well. And um, here with us is Ms. Galico, the found, co-founder and managing director of Aura. Um, she might want to say a few words as well. Yes, of course. Um, firstly, thank you, Nicey. That was a great um, presentation on aura, our values, and the various things we've been doing to survive the pandemic. Um, great to also be in, in the company of so many, um, so many luminaries in the culinary world, um, as well as students of CCA. So thanks for having us. Um, you know, it hasn't been an easy journey. Um, our start, we're, we very much still consider ourselves a startup, you know, we're still a young company to have faced the pandemic. Um, so it th taught us a lot of uh, challenges, but I think it made it even more important um, for us to realize how important it is to, for us to support local communities. And a huge part of that is really our farmers, because if we are not going to do it here within the Philippines, what more elsewhere? Um, I, I was saddened to think before, you know, some people be, you have to make it elsewhere before you can make it in the Philippines. I think that that trend is slowly starting um, to change that we can make it both here and abroad, hopefully at the same time. Um, we're really proud also to share that we're, um, Oro is um, going more into FND. We're actually um, planning to open our first cafe um, in Ikea in the, in the MOA Square area. Um, in a couple of weeks. So that's something um, that we've been working on has kept us really busy um, during the pandemic. Um, it's really um, our way to make sure we are able to share more of our stories, our point of view, lifestyle um, to the Filipino consumer. Um, um, and actually we are also going to open a cafe with our partners in Bahrain really soon. So this is our way to keep promoting Filipino food culture through cacao and uh, chocolate. Kelly, if you don't mind, I have a couple of questions. Chef Philip and I have been dying to um, to meet you because I am a fan of Aura Chocolate. I think I remember your, I know it's been like you started around 2010 about like finding um, cacao in Davao, but then you had your launch in 2017. And I think in the beginning, I was a hoarder. I would always bring this to a store. I was that one person, if there's aura chocolate in an event or if I have to go somewhere, I was packing my luggage with aura chocolate. But I wanted to know what would be, I guess, hearing all the stuff that you're doing, whether it's a cafe or bar in Bahrain or a cafe in I Ikea, Philippines, how do you choose what's next? Because I think sometimes in the Philippines, you can end up doing too much. How, how do you know what is right and how do you know that's the next move? I mean, that's a great question because it is quite challenging, especially as a startup. You're going to have so many opportunities come your way. And because you're so small, you think you have to say yes to every opportunity that that just and sometimes, to be honest, the right answer is no to a lot of those opportunities. Um, I think it's important to always remember what the core values are. Like for Oro, we are a cacao and chocolate company, period. But that doesn't mean that we only are a manufacturer, right? We can also be a distributor, an exporter, and now going into FND. So I think we can diversify, but always the, the thrust at Oro is to focus on the core and make sure that we do that excellently no matter what. So don't we don't like, and we always, Mark and I, who's the, my co-founder, always ask, is this going to help strengthen our core? Um, and then also in terms of partnerships, do those partnerships will allow us to, do more of what we're already doing? Would they align with our values? Um, so 
yeah, that's it. Um, and getting also learning um, to that to have the confidence to say no. Um, that's something I've learned also over the years. It was really hard at first, and now I think we do have the confidence um, to do that more and more. I'm glad you said yes for this, though, because I think I <laughs> was looking for you on Facebook. But one of the things just before we, I know Chef Philip has his own questions, but um, I think when you see a product like our chocolate and you see all the awards, you tend to, as some of our culinary entrepreneurs would be excited and want to dream the same way. But being in business or having a startup doesn't come without headaches. What would be the biggest headaches for you um, having this um, startup? Oof, uh, where do I start? <laughs> um, there have just been so many challenges, but I think part of it is, um, um, well, a lot of it has to do with uh, starting a business in the Philippines. We know it is not the there are pros and cons and um, operationally getting stuff off the ground is not easy. You really have to be extremely detail oriented. Um, especially in the beginning, you must micromanage everything. But obviously when you are now thinking of scaling, then you need to have a team to support you because micromanagement at such a level is no longer becomes uh, possible. But I think it's more like also our ambition to want to control, like that's why we do treat a bar. We want to control every single step of the process. Um, that in itself is extremely challenging because the more that you control, the more mis room you make, right? Um, room for errors that there are. So, um, but we really made that choice and that this is what makes our special, even from like the farming to the fermentation, like we all, we obsess about every single step of the process that is both the huge, um, uh, I mean, it, it, there are just the highs and the lows of that, but I think it is really the key to our success. And that's something in culinary, I think we um, need to really go back to the roots, like of where food comes from. That's a huge passion of mine. Um, really understand who are the people behind it, what are all the processes needed, um, not just to like simply go to a supplier or go to the supermarket and call it a day. I think at the end of the day, we're just much better um, in terms of culinary, culinary, which is an art, in terms of perfecting that art form, getting just elevating um, Filipino standards more and more. So it's never a smooth sailing process. Uh, Chef Philip, I know you have your own questions. We could talk to Kelly yeah, all Well, day. first of all, <laughs> hello. I remember being with you and your team back at Manila House at your launch some years ago. It was a fabulous occasion there. So I'm very proud to hear your story and your parents and, and the whole story and journey of Aura Chocolate and done a number of dinners with your product as well over the years. My first question is, what is your favorite chocolate combination? Combination? Ooh, um, maybe this reveals too much about my personality, but I really like chocolate and alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> I was just <laughs> saying we need tequila in this event. <laughs> chocolate and tequila. We actually did a chocolate and tequila event uh, many years ago to Tour de Mare with cheese. And actually, that leads me on to my next question. So based upon the alcohol, what savory item would you pair with chocolate? savory savory um i mean you mentioned cheese i think cheese is a good way to start but i mean something that uh, maybe nice you had touched on earlier underappreciated is like ramen wow Chocolate yes actually yes a fantastic yeah. combination the umami that you can get um, um and even what something that i personally really like is um to be used in like traditional stews uh, filipino stews as a sauce as a brace you know um bracing liquid um, anything like that because it adds like a nice undernote and a slight fruitiness without being sweet. Cacao so, or so, chocolate is not necessarily just a dessert product. It, it has so many savory applications too. Yeah. So first one would be tequila. Second one would be Mexican. Yeah, right? or, or all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, third one and my final question is which of the chocolate you know i know you produce the chocolate but you know this time of year it's pretty chilly in london pretty cold my son's out there and a nice cup of hot chocolate and of course i grew up a little bit here with tablea here so what have you done to kind of you know you, you're out there globally and nice to hear you opening Bahrain and all over it's such a great product but what in terms of the tablea here what are you doing i'm sure you have your own chocolate coming out for the hot chocolate yeah it's is it discs is it a darker chocolate, you do different types of hot chocolate for drinking. 
Yeah, we, we um, for the cafe that we're opening, we're definitely trying to push a little bit in terms of um, chocolate drink uh, presentation. We'll definitely have white milk and dark, so different options and different thicknesses. But something I also like is, again, going back to the roots and trying to put a new spin on it. So my business partner, co-founder Mark, he's from his family's from Pampanga, so he's always loved peanut hot chocolate, the traditional Whoa. way. But we're just putting our modern spin on it um so using finer cacao and then peanut so um that is still one of my favorites like peanut and chocolate one of the best combinations ever just really working more on the kind of smoothness and bringing out pure peanut and finer chocolate flavor that's funny you said that because brazil nut growing up in london brazil nuts were coated in chocolate that's my dad's favorite there was never any left so we had to have other uh, chocolates but yeah um, Kelly, I just have one follow-up question, um, considering sure. that a lot of our, our audience are either, you know, uh, aspiring food entrepreneurs or chefs. How do you balance, uh, how do you balance Filipino market and international market? Or do you just decide to focus on one and hopefully the other will follow? How does that work for, for a group like Oro? Uh, that's something my team and I continuously discuss because, of course, we receive feedback from everybody. And mm -hmm. our key is to make sure that we're able to synthesize all of that feedback and that information and try to make decisions that would be best for both domestic and export. Because at Aura, we only make one kind of product. We don't distinguish because, you know, these are export only products, as maybe some brands do, and these are only for domestic use. You know, we have some so, such respect for the domestic market that we want to do the same. Um, the challenge is, you know, regionally in export, that's not just one whole, right? Regionally or even, you know, globally, there are so many different preferences. Like uh, just a clear example, the Chinese market, they don't really like sweets, although they'll eat sweets, right? But they are very sensitive to the level of sweetness. Whereas you say in Middle East, it's a whole different ballpark. They love their sweets. So for us, okay. So we make sure that we just have a range that could satisfy um both markets and we really believe like at the end of our philosophy is to think globally act locally um so it's to really utilize local talent local um uh, produce um to serve international both domestic and international markets so it's not easy because we also want to make sure we don't explode our product line but it's just to be really smart about how especially now as we develop new products having key markets in mind and how long does it take? I'm curious because, you know, in the Philippines, like people will just want to do everything really quickly, launch a new product. How long does a product in Aura take? Depends if you asked me three years ago, uh, three to five years ago versus now. Yeah. Um, you know, when we started, we only launched, you know, um, so Philip was there in our event. We only had like really two chocolates and a couple SKUs, like very small product line. And in a really short amount of time, we had gone from like maybe five SKUs to 50. And like, I feel like in a blink of an eye, it would only take us like every time I had an idea, it would only take Mark and I had an idea it'd take us like literally one to two months. I'd be out in the market. Um, but that's not sustainable. You know, as the company goes, we need to be smarter. We need to actually look at data. Um, analyze all of that as we grow. So now, which was not, not really something that was, you know, we were just so excited in the beginning. We didn't even review which products were performing really well and not, and the pandemic forced us to really do all of that, take the time, slow it down. And sometimes it's not bad to slow it down. You must, um, as you scale. So now to answer, it takes us about three to six months now um, okay. to launch a product. And we also put in more effort in terms of surveys, really, having more robust R&D, mm -hmm. um, working on the packaging, really making sure also, so from end to end, um, we have that covered. Um, so we've slowed that down, but I think at the same time, we've been very heavy on pushing collaborations. Yeah. And we do not, uh, when we try to approach every collaboration creatively, we don't want there to be so much overlap. So even if we've slowed this down, we put a, also a lot of effort in that. And we do also unique products for some of our um, collaboration partners. How many hours do you work a day? <laughs> what, how time do you start and what time do you finish? <laughs> not I'm, I'm a new mom. So oh, I, uh, congratulations. I need to balance that, which is With a cafe. That's going to be hard to balance. <laughs> well, I feel like I've always been a mom since or we, we put like, mm -hmm. you know, we incorporated oral, but now, now I have a real baby. Not only is not my only baby. Mm. So um, <laughs> I still work more than I would like. Yeah. Mm. 
Uh, let's just put it at that. It's not necessarily a number of hours, but you know, the, the stress that stays with yeah. you, even mm -hmm. if you're not working actively, that was hard for me to cope with. But I think with a baby, it's helped. Like I needed to compartmentalize. So mm -hmm. I'm actually like working more about like less stress, which is good. <laughs> and that's good. I'm uh, congratulations as well. And we're very excited. I am. Oh, I'm a fan, like an absolute, like, Thank I'm so definitely much. girl crushing on our, our right now. But um, Chef Philip, any questions final before we go? No, on that's it, Baba. Congratulations. I, you know, I've, 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 I've witnessed your journey. And, you know, I was inspired by your Filipino journey in the beginning and, you know, how the generations, because I know that you're the, almost the second generation of, of how it started. It went way, way back. And I remember that story. And I remember, like, you know, your mom and dad, I think, or they got sidewards on the project that you guys took up as the next generation some years later and have made it work. So inspiring and congratulations. And we're very honest to have you here with us selling our um, 25th anniversary. So thank you. And we look forward to further and long-term collaborations with you. So yeah, of course. thank you. Thank you awesome. so much for having me. I see. From students or our, our school, we are happy to help and work with you we love chocolate <laughs> thank you kelly thank you very much Thanks, guys. okay so chef philip um i know you you what's your favorite uh, combination with like chocolate i'm curious savory and chocolate Did you, you know i was i was super inspired uh traveling and, and doing some stuff in mexico and again the tequila and, and and chocolate works tequila and cheese because of the saltiness with the bittersweet also works, but um, anything to do. I think of rabbit, you know, I think of uh, rabbit farming is starting in the Philippines as well. Yeah. I know some people will cringe, but actually yeah, rabbit and chocolate or some form of taco or burrito or something with chocolate. It's just smoked chili inside there. Um, yeah, delicious. Okay. So You know, you and I can talk about different combinations nonstop, but we will go on to <laughs> our the next friend of CC. Actually, she has been a friend of CC for a long time, and she actually helped us celebrate uh, the 20th anniversary in BGC, if you don't remember. So we have uh, Nicole Ponseca, who will be talking about um, sustaining cravings for Filipino food. So just allow me to introduce her a little bit. Um, I met Nicole... Actually, when she asked um, CCA to put together uh, a really home-like Filipino feast for a bunch of uh, writers and media personalities from the States, um, I think they were traveling through Silverline uh, Silver Cruises and they stopped over in the Philippines to go through Bohol and then um, into my grandmother's home. So Nicole Panzaka, as you know, Enterprise has already mentioned how amazing she is, is a graduate of the University of San Francisco and is really a known restaurateur, cookbook author, and honestly, she just wears many hats. I don't know how she does it, um, but she is really known for bringing Filipino food to America to mainstream, first with Maharlika, then with Jeepney, and she is, I don't know, she has so much energy. She's Filipina, but also New Yorker at heart, and just like, just a burst of energy and I'm hoping that she'll wake us up as well. Um, and she wrote a cookbook, I Am a Filipino, which was published by Artisan and received a James Beard Award nomination for Best International Cookbook in 2019. And just a lovely, lovely woman. I can't even explain it, the energy. I hope she's here. Hi, Nicole. Hi. Hi, Hi how are you? How are you? Good, good. So Chef Philip and I are here and we're so excited that you could join us despite the, the time difference. I'm happy to be here. And as you mentioned, I have a lot of energy. So 10 a.m., 10 p.m., whatever it is. Hi, how are you? Hi, Chef Philip. Hi, how are you? Great Hi, to good. meet you. Yeah, very inspiring. You know, I love the uh, talk earlier, but very inspiring. Congratulations on all your success. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I am, uh, I think I'm part of the family at this point. I'm, I'm totally putting myself there. I'm Hamanate out here in New York. And, uh, you know, I was running a little bit late, but I got the pleasure of listening about, uh, about Aura's story. And then, you know, obviously the entrepreneurs, they're a dear friend of mine brought me out to Australia with my book and, 
Um, that's the thing about the Filipino diaspora. We're so, um, we're, there's a myriad of us out there in different parts of the world and through our shared culture and love of our cuisine, we're able to build this, this little community that's beginning to expand exponentially. It's, it's a very different um, world than when I first started my journey of helping put Filipino food on the map. It's, it's surpassed my wildest dreams, but I'm, I'm so elated to see it manifesting the way it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, I got to see some of the presentation from, I believe, Grace. Was it Grace that was doing the presentation? I got to hear her voice. And then uh, obviously, Aura, and I, I don't have a, a big time uh, PowerPoint presentation <laughs> here. So um, I was hoping maybe we can do a little bit of a, of a fireside chat and yeah. hopefully um, I can answer some questions and provide some thoughts on, on Filipino food and, and how I was able to get my start. Uh, and then I, I do have three, three things that I can share of, uh, I guess, what I, what I used to cut through uh, media, get my point across, and, and to put Filipino food on the map. Is that cool? Can we talk for a little bit, and then I can share? Yes, yes. We like, actually, conversations. I mean, we're, we love also presentations, but I'm curious, um, Filipino food is everywhere. I, I'm curious how you sustain it, the to really introduce it with in depth rather than just a hype. And I know media, they're always trying to find the next big thing, right? Mm -hmm. How do you sustain it as like, whether you're a restaurateur or a chef or just a passionate cook as well? Well, um, can, before, before I get into that really quickly, how, how many participants are listening right now? Are these active participants or this is, this is live, right? Are these the majority of the listeners and um, viewers students? Uh, it's a mix. We have people from institutions, government, um, mm -hmm. students as well. We have about 150 with Facebook. Um, but yeah, it's a mix. right? And I'm um, yeah. curious why I understand why I'm, I'm here with you and you've selected Aura and the Entrepreneurs, but why do you think I'd be a, uh, any interest for your for the audience, in your opinion? You're such an advocate of, I mean, you've pushed a lot of Filipino food where a lot of people would say it's not possible. And, you know, a lot of people say, like, if you want to make it big, go to New York. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just this vibrant city. And I think sometimes with uh, whether you're entering culinary school and you're, you have this dream of having a restaurant or being a chef, but then it's all about execution, right? And I think you've done that so well with your restaurants as well as your cookbook and just your overall always purpose. So I just feel like they would have so much to learn from you. Yeah, um, thank you. And uh, Chef Philip, if, if there's anything to chime in, not to fan the flames of idolatry or compliments, but it gives me a, um, some frame of reference of, of what message I can share to be the most help to your students. Um, I don't know if, if you have anything to add, please let me know. I, I think I have an idea, but if there's anything you wanna add. Okay, so basically, sorry. Someone's... Sorry, it was a back noise. Um, basically it's that in California, I have a lot of friends out in California, a lot of Filipinos, I have friends that ran uh, NASCAR out there for, for 40 years. So mm -hmm. we have been working uh, before COVID, during COVID, to work closely with CIA and to bring Filipino food in terms of, I'm a big wine guy. So 500 vineyards, you know, wine is my, next to cooking, it's actually by side by side, wow. you know, bringing, bringing any food, whether I worked in China or Hong Kong or ever in Asia, you know, Philippine food and wine pairings side by side becomes very interesting because Filipino cuisine is so unique compared to, say, Thailand, Vietnam, China, wherever I've been, Philippines is just, you can't put it in a box. It's so unique. It's so evolving. But wine, especially Napa wine and then Californian wine, in terms of pairing, what do you drink with Filipino food? Cocktails, we have amazing bartenders here and amazing fruits. But how's that developing in terms of food and wine pairing and degustation and just fun occasions ah. with the grapes? You know, sure. Grape juice. Sure, uh, great. Two different perspectives, and I'm, I'm happy to illuminate 
um, some of my thoughts on them. And thank you again for having me here. Uh, the, the conversation about wine and Filipino food has always been tenuous, especially if you look at the cuisine in its totality uh, from the north until the south, what can you guess is the thread line of Filipino food? Any guesses what flavor profile? Want to throw anything out there, Bea or, or Phil? Is there any one particular flavor profile that runs unique to Filipino cuisine? Any guesses? No? I, I'm happy to. Vinic students, come vinegar, on. Vinegar, <laughs> vin vin yeah, yeah. Let's, someone else could jump in. But, no, that's I mean, it. When you have Go ahead, Chuck. Vinegar and salt. Vinegar and yes. salt are big, right? And then sweet. So you're talking yeah. about food comparing to grapes, which are also sweet and acid and acidy. Yeah. So the balance is, 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 you have to be clever, right? You have to be smart sure. with pairing. Yeah, you know, there. I, I'd like for you to take note of a, a grand sommelier here in New York City. His name is Miguel De Leon. You can catch him on Instagram. He's a psalm in a restaurant in Soho. Uh, he's Filipino, he's proud, and he is uh, riding the wave of diversity that's happening across media, especially, uh, particularly in the United States, and particularly in food media. Uh, being brown, being a person of color, representing an ethnicity, is uh, finding uh, its way in, in major media in a way that it never had before. So I encourage you and your students to check him out. He's a total, is it called onophile, right? If you're a wine connoisseur. So what he introduced me to is natural and biodynamic wines. Mm. And I'm such a fan. Um, I, I won't nerd out completely because I think that there's people who can do an even better job or can do a better job than I. I don't want to embarrass myself. But the, the realm of natural and bi biodynamic wines has such a huge impact with Filipino food. It's, it complements in saltiness. It, the, it's not competing. It's a total compliment to it. And I know that there's not a lot of people that are um, into orange wines. I think that that's changing. But for me, Chef Philip, if you were to ask me what I think is the future of Filipino food and wine, I would, I would circle natural dynamic, biodynamic and orange wines. And you're going to find a wonderful song and dance that uh, I would have never, ever thought. Um, you have the soil, the air, the, the flavor profile, the acidity, it, a natural and dynamic and orange wines are, are a, a curiosity to me that I don't even know what other cuisines it could pair as well with in Filipino food. And so um, chef, uh, that would be my answer about wines and heading back to Bea, you know, the one thing that you really struck to me when you said the people that are watching could be government officials, students. I mean, it sounds like there's a total uh, cross section of different people that might be viewing this and might have some interest in what I have to say. And I think you did an amazing uh, introduction and thank you. But I'd like to just add a couple of things to the narrative. Um, when I started out, it was 1998. I was 21 years old. I was working in an ad agency and I felt very excited. I got to New York and I was living my dream and I was in a career that I had worked since I was a freshman in high school to get into. And what I started realizing is working on strategy and commercials that the primary target that they would talk to is not Filipino, wasn't brown and certainly not even um, black at that time. In fact, if you wanted to talk to black people, you would say, we're gonna talk to Ebony and Essence Magazine. And if we're gonna talk to white people, we're gonna talk to every, every, all the other media channels. It's only now that things have become more integrated. And I was so shocked. It was like a, it was like a ton of bricks had hit me over the head that, wow, I, if people don't know who I am, if there's no representation in the media, would they be curious? Do they, will, will there be any opportunity for them to ask me questions or, or even instigate conversation to engage with one another? And so I thought, hmm, maybe I could do something about that. Again, I never thought I was going to get into food or rather, maybe you did know this, I never thought I was going to get into food or, or be in a restaurant or certainly write a cookbook. And I thought maybe I can change representation through food. And so for 12 years, while I was in an ad exec by day, at night, I started off as a dishwasher, I was a host, I was a waitress, and uh, my, the two worlds didn't know about each other. 
Um, I didn't want my ad and executive job to know that I had a total different life. And I didn't want the nightlife to know that I was some uh, corporate person. And my sole goal was to put Filipino food on the map. And what was happening in 1998 and then even 10 years later, 2008, and even 12 years later, uh, 2010, Filipino food was not represented was not represented in the United States outside of Daly City, Queens, or what, what would be the equivalent of Cavite to Manila, or um, I don't know, Ilocos Norte to Manila. It, just Filipino food were on the outskirts. It wasn't in, in the big city. And I was, I was very sad about that. And uh, I would travel around the United States and it became my sole mission to create the first commercially and critically successful Filipino restaurant that could pierce through and uh, make a difference and, and change the course, not only of restaurants and food, but uh, Filipino people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I, I, I would like your viewers to know that this was a gargantuan, um, I don't know, challenge. I was 21 years old. So if you're a student out there and you'd like to make a difference, I'd like to let you know that it actually is possible. When Maharlika, my first restaurant opened in 2011, it was an onslaught of media attention and there were lines around the, the door and people were beginning to ask, what is Filipino food? The one thing I have to say in being a Filipino food storyteller and I would want everyone to know this, if you're a chef, if you're an entrepreneur or an operator, understand your point of view. And I would, it's very hard not to, but I would venture to say, do not seek validation from others, not in your flavor profiles or your choice or your execution. You have to come to the table with a point of view. You don't have to be the loudest one. You don't, you know, there's so many ways you can do that but harness uh, your quality. And uh, that would be my first step in uh, figuring out how to be a storyteller of Filipino food. What is the story that you're here to tell? Is it a story about your province? Is it a story about uh, a particular ingredients? And in the case of Aura chocolates, it's about chocolates. Um, but, but find out what you're here to talk about. And that is the very first step I would say about um, creating a, a storyline. In the case of entrepreneurs in Australia, I would say for them, it's about connection. If I were to guess, they're here to connect Filipinos in Australia and the outside world and, and create a community. So if you're out there or Bea for CCA, the, I could ask the same question. What is CCA's uh, point of view and what do they want to get across? So that's my first point in uh, storytelling. Yeah. Um, are you still with me? Are we here? Are we good? Do you have any yes, questions? Yes, my God, I'm just <laughs> awestruck because I think it's one of these things you've summarized all our speakers here and each one has, you know, they were talking about hyper local before, but I think it's really that story that it doesn't have to be so specific to a region or a province, but you need to have something specific. You can't just say, oh, I'm doing all of Filipino food, you know, no, I think no, there has I to be something unique. Yes, for me, for Maharlika, my, I guess my story, my narrative could be a, a Filipino in New York. If you have an American in Paris, one of my favorite movies, the storyline at Maharlika was a Filipino in New York. And in Jeepney, um, my second restaurant, the, the story here was Filipino American. I really embraced the idea of Jeepney, which is the ultimate in uh, Calabos, uh, World War II Jeep being left behind in the Philippines and Filipinos making it completely their own. So uh, at any given time, you can ask me why I'm doing something and I can tell you exactly what I'm doing it for because that's my point of view. So I encourage the people out there to really think hard about what they're here to do. It's not just Filipino food, there, there's a nugget that's going to make you special, that is going to make you specific and is ultimately going to pierce through the market. So that's my first uh, piece of advice. Yeah. I just had a thought because I never, ever like got to dine in your restaurant uh, because I haven't traveled to New York in that time that you had it. But I remember looking at your menu online. I was like, I want to eat here. And oh, then uh, one of it had like uh, something about Imelda and then another one, Manny Pacquiao. And I was just th thinking that restaurants now, they can be a museum. Like that it doesn't have to be your typical white walled museum. It could be a restaurant. 
And you can Thank learn you so much that. more. Thank you for that. You know, when I had two dishes on my menu, one was um, eggs, uh, uh, eggs, I think benigno. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and know. then eggs and malva. And eggs benigno was a take on an eggs benedict and it was poached egg on um, on the sal with spam and a calamansi hollandaise. And then eggs and melda was a take on Florentine, but instead of cream spinach, we did uh, lain. And it was never a point to be pro Marcos or not pro Marcos or pro Aquina. And that's not ultimately why I'm here, but food can be very political. And one of my greatest um, experiences at Maharlika was walking by a table and there was a woman in her twenties and then a woman probably in her about fifties or sixties, they were related, you know, Tita and they were saying Anak. And she looked at the menu and she said, why is it eggs Imelda? And she asked her Tita, and that was such a beautiful moment because they could exchange story about history, about politics. And in whatever I do, I try to be just a little bit political, if not a lot of bit political. And uh, I was so happy to do that because um, we could have a conversation about history and we're not uh, often taught that, especially in the United States. Yeah. 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 So um, the second thing that I want to provide as a, a piece of um, advice or what I used um, is really understand who your audience is. And that's why when we started this conversation at the, at just a few minutes ago, I, I wanted to do it a little bit different. I wanted this to be a fireside chat. I wanted to find out who, who we're talking to. That way, I hope that you're getting the most from this conversation that we're having here. And please, if there's any questions, we can accept questions, right? Yeah, is that? Yeah, yeah. And if we're sure. on any time limit, it's 1036 here in the Hamptons. Um, just let me know if there's a, if you want me to wrap it up, but I have two points here, two more. The second one is know your audience. And if, uh, if I were to start talking about supply chain and, and, you know, uh, I don't know the, the attributes of adobo, this might not be the right room for it, but I wanted to understand who we're talking to. And I also encourage the young chefs out there or government officials or operators, be very specific about who you're talking to and be, be very uh, courteous and generous to them when you're cultivating uh, a dish or a menu or a point of view. Know that I want this particular person and you can create that personality. Is she 25 years old? Is she in school? Does she live here? Does she, is she on a budget? Does she have deep pockets? Whatever it is, create that person. And every time you make a dish, you put that on the table and you're asking, does this person like it? Your imaginary friend, the person that you want to um, make happy, it could be your grandma, whatever it is. But if you understand who you're talking to, you can commit so much devotion and love to the dish that you make. And, and that's what we did every single day in Maharla Kanjitni when I created my menu. So know your audience, that's number two. Any questions? Please, guys, I really want to encourage anyone because this is the time we don't usually get this kind of like um, exchange and uh, you have the opportunity to ask me whatever you want. Um, and then the third thing I would say is I utilize a creative brief whenever I um, come up with an idea, a dish or, or menu or even my cookbook, I used a creative brief and you can look up a creative brief online. It's readily available. There's templates everywhere and it will encourage you to ask, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Who am I talking to? What is the price point? What is the personality? And almost every decision I make will veer back to a creative brief and will we'll make your business plan sharper, your dishes sharper, everything because more clarity once um, you create a creative brief. So those are, those are my three tips. Um, last one is a creative brief. The second one is know your audience. And what was the first one? I don't even remember. I wrote it down. Um, have a point of view. Know exactly um, who you are and, and what is the impact that you're trying to make. So those are my tips on storytelling that have helped me so far. Thank you, Nicole. I love the second one because I'm a big believer in this. I always tell people, like, have a list of questions, ask him, ask them what they fear, what they dream of. And that way you can really envision who you are 
um, serving and no matter what business you are in, but people laugh because it's, it sounds really creepy or it's, uh, it sounds like you're a stalker, but the more you know your customer or your ideal customer, yeah. I think helps you so much and you will hit this like better success. Because I remember um, when I started, whether it's my business or my podcast, you think it's for you. And then you realize later on, actually, it's not whoever I'm talking to is not for me. It's actually a different person that has different qualities than I as a business person. That's are. so true. You know, it might, it might not be someone who is anything like you, but is so interested in you and yeah. interested in your point of view or interested in what you have to say. And that could be a, a, a total market for yourself when you're creating a restaurant. It, it might not have anything to do with you. It might actually be people who are looking for something different, looking for something new and want to explore. That's a great point, Bea. Thank you. Yeah. You're not always your business, but um, every, anyone who has questions, please feel free to ask or Chef Philip, I think you. I do have a question. Sure. Yeah, go for it. My question is, where do you see yourself? You know, obviously the success so far has been amazing because you also said that kind of surprise yourself where you are and what you've done and how things came together. Where do you see yourself in three years from now? Three years? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. You know, the pandemic, a lot, a lot happened in the last year, if you don't mind me um, sharing with you. Um, here in America, we're on Thanksgiving Eve. It's a, the American holiday um, where we're all going to eat turkey tomorrow. This is also the anniversary of my father catching COVID and then passing away um, four days later. He passed away of COVID. And, and yeah, thank you. Um, my father passing away, COVID annihilated, annihilated New York City and the restaurant industry. And I stayed open for quite longer than I thought, um, a year and eight months. And um, I could have stayed open. I, I did a shit ton. Can I say shit ton in the Philippines? I did a shit ton of pivots. I did a meal plan and, you know, even my, my meal kit got a rave review by the New Yorker and said it was the most brilliant and satisfying product to come out of COVID. I've been blessed with um, wonderful um, press and uh, support, but I pulled the plug on COVID. I pulled the plug on GP during COVID and I said goodbye to my dad and I actually left New York after 23 years and I moved uh, to Miami and I did all of this because even three years ago, I knew I wanted to close GP. I didn't want to be in the basement of a restaurant looking up reservations. I, I thought that I did exactly what I wanted to do was to put Filipino food on the map. I had two successful restaurants and then a cookbook. But I thought to myself, I would like something more for me. Um, I love to fall in love. I love to explore life. I mean, I feel somewhat sheltered because I just worked for 23 years I feel like I'm almost out of prison because all I did was work and work and work so um you ask me where do I see myself in three years and the old me would have said oh I'm gonna have this restaurant and I'm gonna do another book and that's certainly um still part of me but I'd say that right now I'm I'm in a transition period and I'm really figuring out what the next move is, even so far as what is my role in Filipino food. My role in Filipino food 20 years ago and even 10 years ago when I opened Maharlika was very specific. But now the market has changed completely. There's a lot of new chefs. There's a lot of new excitement and people. And it's, it's very different than when I was starting out. When I was coming up, other Filipino chefs were mean to me. They, they were very competitive. It was a very um, crab mentality. The chefs that I see that are coming out of the States right now are very collaborative, very supportive, in a very different uh, frame of mind than when I was coming up. So the question for me that you're asking is where do I see myself in three years? Um, maybe we revisit that in a year as I figure it out. But yeah, thank you for the question. Hopefully happy. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you so much for sharing that. Very personal and very deep. Luna. But uh, I think COVID is really... <laughs> yeah, come, yeah. What's that? There is a question from... Uh, Dr. Arluna said, come to the Philippines. 
Or Australia. You know, I see a many invitations. Oh, I see now. <laughs> Wait, okay, I see questions. Thank you. Uh, as James Beard recipient, how does yeah, feel? That's one question I was curious. Like when you get an accolade like that or, you know, a nomination, how does it feel? Because some people say um, it's like, it's not, you know, it doesn't make you truly happy, but I'm curious about it. Yeah, you know, you and then Chef Phil, thank you for um, thanking me for sharing that. And I tend, I do like getting a little deep here. Um, it, it's, it, I can keep it topical and very light. That's not really my bag. That's not my point of view. So I know who I am when I come to the table. I, I'd like to um, be as vulnerable as possible and, and give as uh, hopefully receive it back. Um, so you asked, what did it feel like? Well, um, can I do a little humble brag for a moment? Like we won best burger in New York City. Uh, James Beard nominee. We went to a third, second printing after six weeks, a third printing after three months, um, two stars by the New York Times. Um, it, it was a phenomenal run of success and press. And we never even had a PR company like that. Um, I remember the third day of my pop up, there was a, two, a line around the block in New York City in the dead of winter. Um, and that was my happiest, probably when I when I started the journey, just seeing people respond. I am very grateful for the press. I am very grateful for the accolades. Uh, but I'll tell you, Phil, or who, or I'm not sure who asked the question. What did it feel like? I was just so mired in the in work, and I just kept my head down. And I did not want my self-esteem to come up because of the accolades and the awards and the access, because I knew that if one day it wasn't there, or if I got a shitty review on Yelp, that my self-esteem would immediately plummet uh, as well. You cannot accept the good and think you're that great and not also accept the bad and think you're that awful. So for better or for worse, I didn't relish in it too much when it was happening because I didn't want to um, have my self-esteem based on it. But I am very, 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 very grateful for it. So I, I knew in my creative brief that I wanted to be award-winning. I knew I wanted to break down bamboo ceilings. Um, but when it was happening, I just stayed fucking humble. Can I say fucking humble in the Philippines? I stayed fucking humble because I just didn't want to be that bitch. And there's going to be others who want to <laughs> ride that wave and kudos to them. That's never been my personality. And I'm, I'm happy that I could just uh, show up authentically myself. So that's my answer. Did, <laughs> did you have a strong, did you like within the team, but to create a restaurant, um, to create the venues you have. You mm -hmm. always need a, a right winger or a left winger. Yeah. Being a Filipino in another country, right? Like, how did you work with the team? How did you create a team? And where is your team now? I mean, obviously, it's, you know, it's kind of lonely sometimes, right? Going out there and flying the flag. But were you able to get a wingman or a wingwoman on the left, right from the Philippines to help you in your journey and your vision, your mission? And where are they now? You know, are you proud of them? Are they out there doing stuff? Damn, Phil, you, you're coming in hot with all the questions. I love it. Thank you. The first question is, I did not do it alone. I clearly had a team. The first 12 years of my um, journey, even if I was alone, I was never fully alone because I was constantly engaging and learning from my mentors, learning from other chefs. So you're never truly alone, but it, what it, but it is very lonely. Um, I, I know that firsthand there were many holidays I spent uh, by myself or with my kitchen team actually serving and not enjoying. Um, and to be very clear, there was a small circle of people that joined me. Um, the first was Chef Miguel Trinidad. And um, I would say that when I was starting out, there were a, a handful of Filipino chefs and I would knock on their door and say, would you help me? I have a dream. I want to put Filipino food on the map. And there were so many doors that were closed in my face. Like, no, 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 not interested. Americans are never going to like Filipino food. They're never going to pay a price. Filipinos are never going to pay for it. So I was like, fuck, 
what am I going to do? And there was this man named Miguel Trinidad, who I was working with at a restaurant. And he saw me crying in the corner one day. I had almost given up on my dream. And he said, well, why don't I um, give it a shot? Why don't I help you? And I was like, well, what the, what the hell do you know about Filipino food? You, you know, mm -hmm. it, it really challenged me to think, what, are, what is the culinary arts? And um, he, he joined me. He would come with me to the Philippines. He, was, he is Latino, so he understood some smatterings of the, the flavor profile and the same kind of trinity that we employ in both cultures or the sofrito. Um, so he was very instrumental. And I'm so happy to say that along the way, we tried our own ways of collaborating. Again, that's very different than it is now. I mean, the collabos are coming in left and right, but then it was not happening. I chose to use my, flat, my platform to engage other young chefs. So to your next question, Chef Phil, uh, where are some of them now? Uh, one of my guest chefs had never cooked Filipino food before. She is Filipino, is an Italian chef. She just opened a restaurant not too long ago called Musang in Seattle. That was, I think, voted number one restaurant in Seattle. So check her out. There's Chef Harold Villarosa that just launched his own um, signature um, sauces. There's um, chef uh, in sommelier, uh, Miguel de Leon, who's now writing. I mean, there were so many people that came and worked with us and collaborated with us. And there's chef Natalie um, Nera, who started with us from literally day one, who's now venturing into her own um, culinary journey. So be mindful of the people that support you or you work with because you will cross paths with them always. Um, but I have to say, uh, if I can get real again, because, you know, I like to get real. <laughs> um, when I started, I was faced with a lot of um, pushback, a lot of hateration. Uh, I even think being a woman and, and then a person in a position of power um, garnered a lot of uh, who the hell does she think she is or um, there was a, a, a testiness to me being in power and I, I could feel it uh, very different if I were a male, I'd say. And it wasn't easy. And I think the political world that we're in now, I would not face that. I would probably be way more supported just for being a woman and showing up. That was not the case. I, I don't uh, regret that. I, I think I'm, I'm a tough cookie, although I wear my vulnerabilities pretty open, but uh, I became stronger for it. So. Nicole, we appreciate so much of your bravery and everything that you've done with the representation as well as being as a woman and so many different qualities. And I think if there's a lot I've learned from like purpose, from a creative brief to knowing your audience. And again, we thank you for making the time. I know how late it is there. Um, but yeah, hopefully. No problem. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. I hope you yes. Yes. have a great jubilee. <laughs> and keep in touch and uh i look forward to the next time we can connect yes and hey, come awesome to talking to you <laughs> yes. awesome talking to you thank you so much thanks yeah. chef bill talk to you soon thank you hope okay. to see you there okay bye thank you see you thank you chef philip i think we have two more speakers um if you can go ahead and introduce our next couple speakers i think these people are very interesting as well Philip, who do we have next? I think you're in. Okay, we're back. So we have Chef Angelo Giesen. Uh, and I think it will pop up his uh, um, background. Is it popping up now? So I can read off the script. Chef Angelo. 
Here we go. Okay, Chef Cello attended two culinary education programs in CCA Manila, Fundamentals in Culinary Arts and Fundamentals in Baking and Pastry Arts. He is now connected to CCA as a chef instructor for Fundamentals in Culinary Arts. Aside, aside from his passion for teaching, Evangelo marks his sixth month as a food content creator with 246,000 TikTok followers, a hobby that has become an advocacy to create a platform that shares recipes and techniques in the hope of somewhere or someone will learn from the content. From, from simply, simply posting, posting recipe, recipe videos, videos on TikTok, TikTok. Chef Angelo Beeson gets an opportunity now to partner and collaborate with some brands such as KFC, Cow Imperial Tea, Jolly Eats, McCormick Philippines, Maggie, La Incrisor, Ro BH, and many more. So let's welcome Chef Angelo Gison. Hi, Angelo. Hi, I'm Jello Gison. I'm a food content creator. I am a chef and I'm a culinary instructor at Center for Culinary Arts Manila. I got into TikTok in February of this year because I needed an outlet for my creativity. So I said, um, what if I make short videos and share it on that platform so people might learn something and that's how I started. The things that I've learned in CCA definitely helped me in creating cooking videos because of the techniques um, and some of the recipes that uh, we were taught nagagamit ko rin sa mga videos ko. Content creation is different from actual cooking in a number of ways. Number one, in content creation, there's so much um, importance given to aesthetics kasi kailangan maganda tingnan yung pagkain, maganda tingnan yung angulo mo, yung pagluluto mo, yung even yung lighting, ganyan. So, all of those things you consider even sound, ganyan. Um, another thing is, sa actual cooking, tuloy-tuloy lang tayo. Sa content creation, sometimes you have to stop, turn off the heat kasi kailangan mong kunan tong ingredient na to na close up. Minsan naman kailangan medyo malayo yung shot. Minsan kailangan slow-mo, tas minsan hindi mo nakuha yung shot na mahusay, so paulit-ulit mong ginagawa. So, yun yung mga major differences. My advice for people who want to get into TikTok is just do it. Nung una din, namung problema ko, iniisip ko, how's yung mga angles ng camera, paano yung lighting, paano yung sound, anong gagawin ko, anong iko-content ko. First, number one, you have to be true to yourself. Ano yung mahusay ka, ano yung magaling ka, that's the content that you need to make para authentic, para meron ka ring authority. Number two, um, just do it because yung style naman, yung aesthetics, yung technicalities, you will learn it along the way. Just go ahead and produce content that's close to your heart, content that you know, and content that you think will help other people learn something new. The favorite recipe that I made for TikTok was the bread pudding. Uh, kasi, um, I said towards the end ng video na yon na may dessert ka na, nakatipid ka pa. And then people reacted saying, how come nakatipid? Eh, bibili pa ng milk, ng butter, ng sugar, and everything. My point there was, kasi you're gonna use stale bread, so you're not gonna buy bread anymore. So, nakatipid ka din, di ba? So, it had a lot of engagement, a lot of exchange of ideas, and right now, it has 2.2 million views and counting. Uh, growth hacks or techniques. I think you just have to make sure that your content is made thoroughly. It's quality. It means um, visually audio, lighting, um, the content itself, there's a story, the visuals are good para ma-engage yung mga uh, viewers. Remember that in any platform, the first 20 seconds is the most important. You have to catch the attention of your viewers in the first 20 seconds para uh, ma-hook sila. The difference between TikTok and other social media platforms is that, of course, ito yung nagpauso ng 30 second, 1 minute content and that everything should be there. So, nuggets of information talaga yung kailangan. It ha the content has to be catchy. It has to um, get the attention of your audience. And it's fun because ang dami mong pwedeng matutunan sa TikTok, hindi lang pagdating sa pagluluto, sa fashion, sa travel, sa life, um, psychology, law, medicine, ang dami mong pwedeng matutunan in a short bit of time. Kaya, it's a good platform to actually look for 
information that are verifiable and are factual. Kasi no to disinformation. Again, I'm Jel Lugison and I'm born in CCA. Happy 25th anniversary, CCA! I love that. Uh, you know, Sh Chef Jello is always the most enthusiastic, <laughs> vibrant person. Like, imagine getting taught by him in one of our courses. Like, you would definitely be like you were in a TikTok <laughs> class, but uh, spot on with the 30 seconds, uh, 20, first 20 seconds. Actually, some even people say seven seconds, right? Our attention span is so short, and I think people need to just understand that and take advantage. Um, whether it's a 30 second to one minute video, video that will help, help remove their... Oh, sorry, just echoing. Who, who do we have next, Chef Philip? Okay, so um, I'm actually very, very proud to introduce um, Chef John Badabatura, who was previously a student so many years back. Um, Chef John Badabatura is a graduate of the Diploma of Culinary Arts and Technology Management at CCA Manila and currently the executive chef of the newly opened Hilton Abu Dhabi, yes, island. He is a content contributor of multiple cookbooks and a recipient of countless awards throughout his 15-year professional career. He began his career in the UAE and a chef de, as a chef de party and in 2007 moved his way up the ranks through various hospitality groups Chef John's speciality is Mediterranean cuisine. And over the last few years, he has been spending his time rediscovering his heritage dishes. He, he, has, a dry, he has been a driving force and is a driving force in developing not only Yaz Island, but Abu Dhabi's culinary footprint into an evolving culinary destination. Without further ado, welcome to the virtual floor, Chef John Bonaventura. Uh, hello. Um, good morning. Uh, I don't know if it's morning there or afternoon or good evening. Um, my name is John Buenaventura. I am the cluster executive chef for Hilton Abu Dhabi As Island. I'm a proud graduate of CCA Manila. So, uh, I've been in the industry for 14 years. My first uh, passion was actually not really cooking. It, I wanted to be an architect or a graphic designer when I, I started. However, that uh, part of my life got uh, a bit shot down because it... it, it didn't really give me enough excitement. Um, so what I did was I went through a discovery course in CCA and then eventually I fell in love with the, with the drama in the kitchen and and finally went to this career in this career path. And now um, 14 years after, no, no, sorry, uh, 17 years after, I'm, I'm, I'm here in, in the UAE um, leading one of the biggest properties of Hilton and uh, very proud to be a Filipino and very proud to be a graduate of, of CCA Manila. Uh, there's a few questions that uh, has been sent to me and I'm really excited to, to share with you um, what I think and what I've been through and uh, my whole career path in, in the UAE or in, at least in the culinary world, right? Some of you might not believe it or whatever, but generally what inspires me is every time that we, we do something or I personally do something uh, through food and it genuinely makes someone happy. This, this takes out all the, uh, all the 18 hours of working, the hard work, the, the shouting, the pressure, all the sacrifices. It, it, it just, um, just disappears. Right? Um, I'm very passionate about cooking and uh, I fell in love with my craft. Um, and I've, I think I've dedicated uh, most of my life in this. And uh, yeah, so I, I get inspired, uh, well, number one, by, by the guests or, or the people that you cook for. Um, every time us chefs cook for, some, for someone or every time when we cook something, a part of us is left behind in the food we cook. Um, another inspiration maybe, like, like right now, we see a lot of, a lot of young chefs who are in the industry that that are still starting up and it's it's nice to see it's nice to to share your knowledge it's nice to see um young chefs growing uh, especially from the philippines especially populating the the international um, international stage of course um in terms of uh, personal life of course my family right i mean i'm doing all of this uh, Yes, for myself to grow my career and everything, but at the end of the day, we all do it because out of out of um, 
pride and love for the people that that care about us. Um, and of course, I won't. I won't be. I won't be. Should I say? Um, a hypocrite, right? Because being an executive chef also pays good money. Um, but a lot of also again students who are just starting out uh, needs to understand that you need to go through a lot before you reach a position where you are. Right? You have to sacrifice time. Um, and you need to put in a lot of effort and hard work if you really want to achieve what, we, what you want to achieve. Being the youngest executive chef in the region and being the youngest in, in the Hilton group, um, I'm more hands-on. I, I make sure that I teach my team not just by talking to them, but actually showing them the job hands-on. Right? If I, For me, uh, my leadership style is more of like... Uh, do leading by by doing it um showing showing that that you could be a good example for them that you can do what you're asking them to do um being an executive chef here in in, in the uae again like what i said previously it's very tough right because the demand is there the competition is there and again like i said we have more than 300 hotels in one region uh competing for the same market and uh, you you really need to uh, tap in the niche you really need to be in your your a game to be able to do this right um, I do know for a fact that I cannot do what I do without my my team uh, behind me I have a I have a solid uh, solid team I have a really good um, power a powerhouse in terms of uh, my right hand my left hand and the people backing me up just tell you the difference between hotel food and standalone restaurant food right um okay how do we again uh you need to know the ethos and and the concept of what you're doing right or or the core values of the establishment where you're in like for example uh in hilton abu dhabi as island we are in the capital of the uae in abu dhabi and of course we have a lot of um local market like the emiratis and and, and the, the local uh, arabs are here right so eventually our menus our should i say offerings need to match what what the market wants and that's one part wherein you know we we tell a story to the guests or even to the tourists of what abu dhabi is so for example if you're a tourist coming from the philippines or from from the uk whatsoever when you visit hilton abu dhabi as island the first impression would we would need to give you that arabesque uh, arabesque um, feel to it, right? But we're not traditional. We're not an Arabic hotel. We're not a traditional Arabic hotel. But we put a bit of touches. We have we have the modern touch of things, um, and from there you have your specific outlets and restaurants, right? With different themes and different ethos. Like in the lobby, we have we have our lobby lounge called Osmo. Now Osmo is is coming from the word osmosis, right? So it's water, it's, it's, um, it's a little bit uh, related to the Arabian luxury hospitality kind of thing. So our, our dishes there, so this is where we serve our afternoon tea, our coffees, our pastries, uh, lobby lounge menu. So, so in, this, in this part, this is where we, where we infuse a bit of the Arabic taste in, in the food. Uh, like for example, like for example, we have tiramisu in the lobby. Every hotel has tiramisu, but our tiramisu is quite different because we use the Arabic coffee. It's called kahwa. Um, we infuse it with uh, our homemade uh, bathita, late lady finger. Bathita is is an Arabic uh, local Emirati crumble where if you put it together and add a, a few ingredients, you can build something like a lady finger, which is the traditional ingredient for for a tiramisu and then we, we infuse it with your Arabic coffee and then you, of course you put your cream, a bit of rose water. So we kind of like tweak it a bit. Um, and this is how we tell the story um, of food through, through our food, right? If you go to one of our outlets, it's called Grafos. Grafos is more, it's come from two, for, uh, it, 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 it literally means, um, it's like picturesque, right? Uh, photos and, and, and graph, right? So. The restaurant, I wish I could show you. I'll try to send you a few photos of the restaurant once, once it's going. Um, the restaurant is very Instagrammable, so to speak. It's very picturesque. It's a very, it's very, um, there's a lot of cool elements happening in, in the restaurant every time. Um, so anywhere you go, you can take a photo. It's, it's different. Uh, there's some, there we have 
food trucks inside. We have a tuk-tuk there who's serving coffee. We have tuk-tuk serving ice cream. Uh, we have the Arabic section. We have an so it's a basically our all day dining. But the concept is more of like a market concept. So when you go there, it's noisy. Everybody's asking for this. Everybody's asking for that. So that's the whole ethos of, of the place. And this is where we tell the story of Grafos, right? That, you know, the guests can come in, they can take pictures. It, we're, we're bringing them into a journey through, a journey through food, through the different um, cooking stations of the restaurant and then kind of like a world travel kind of thing. Again, telling... Uh, a story through food it depends on where you are and, and how we do it is through the ethos of every restaurant, right? Um, the language that we speak, um, the uniform of the staff, it's a holistic experience from the plates that we use to the cutleries to, to the beverages. It's all in line with, with the brand guidelines and, and the ethos of the restaurant. So that's how the, the people and the guests get uh, the story. Hotels are now trying up, trying to approach uh, restaurants uh, like how they would approach standalone restaurants, wherein um, they really focus on. Uh, I mean, being consistent is one thing, but being consistently good is another thing. Um, they, they, I think they're now really trying to get in proper um, skilled chefs in terms of their in their cuisine and trying to break the boundaries of being uh, stiff in terms of hotel standards and, and everything, right? Even just with the plating style of hotels nowadays, there it's it has moved massively to, to the modern touch. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's bridging the gap now. Um, but yeah, I think r recently the approach to, to running restaurants and hotels has moved so much and has grown so much into focusing uh, really on, on, on the food and a bit more relaxed kind of style of service, uh, which people are a bit more uh, in tune now. I think that's the mar that's the what what the market wants nowadays. Uh, just to give you a bit of a story on on what I what I've been through and what I went through. Um, just to give you, give you a bit back an idea. I mean, two thousand seven, I started my career. I left the Philippines around 2007, right? So 2005, I finished uh, CCA Manila. And then I got the opportunity to open my first restaurant in the fort in Bonifacio, High Street, right? Uh, but, you know, again, as a typical fresh graduate, uh, culinary school, you know, I, th I thought that I could do everything. I was too naive. Um, and, you know, I, I took in a project. And obviously, what would you do with a 17-year-old fresher opening his first restaurant with with no experience and just equipped with theories and, and uh, culinary studies, right? Of course, it helped a lot, but the, the, the things that I, I learned from CCA actually helped me more now than before when I was starting. Because when you're starting, you, you just need to gain experience and see how it is. And once you reach into a supervisory level or like assistant manager level, this is where your theory comes into play, right? Of course, you don't forget your theory and background. So I opened my first restaurant there uh, in the Fort Ship. Unfortunately, it closed down after a year, right? Uh, obviously, it's, it was, you know, it, of course, it's, it, it has a lot of moving factors around it. But again, I think more than that, I think it was more of the ego of being naive and thinking that uh, I could do everything and I'm, in, I'm the best chef in the world. And I think all, all of us chefs have been through that stage in our life and we are guilty of that. I figured out that I need to, again, go back to my roots and start, start from the bottom. So I decided to leave the Philippines and uh, I managed to get um, my first uh, hotel job in Intercontinental Group. It's very important to get a good, strong foundation uh, in your cooking skills and traditional methods uh, at the start of your career. I went to Maldives for one and a half years. I was uh, uh, a chef de, uh, chef de party there. After that experience, you know, I figured that, you know, I... I got an opportunity to work for an award-winning steakhouse in Dubai. So I went in, I went uh, to work for the Raffles group. So yeah, so I was, I was running the, that was my first experience into more of like a upscale casual uh, steakhouse restaurant. So I, my chef de cuisine back then was from Canada. Um, he was very good. I learned a lot of uh, flavor profiles and that's where I kind of like explored um, being creative. And then straight after that, um, again, I got an opportunity to work for a very, um, very 
big group, uh, a very reputable group uh, called SBM, uh, Société de Bande Mer. They are the, the group responsible for the hotel in Monaco called the uh, well, Hotel de Paris. After two years, I decided to go back to hotels. I decided to go work for a bigger hotel. Um, and I think uh, I, I got the opportunity to work as the chef de cuisine for an all-day dining restaurant, which is the first time that I was doing that. Um, I think to be an executive chef, you need to be to have experience in, in different areas and go around different kitchens to learn. Um, after a good two years, we we then um, I got an opportunity now to work for the iconic uh, Atlantis, Atlantis the Palm. Um, so. This is the first time that I got a little bit scared uh, on what I'm doing because this is the first time that I was handling a full-on um, upper upper scale, uh, upscale casual restaurant, uh, almost fine dining. Um, it was a really big, bold move. Uh, it was really tough. Um, there were a lot of chefs uh, who did the food tasting for the for the restaurant. I was lucky. Uh, it was my birthday when I did my food tasting, and I I, I got the job on my birthday. But you know, when, when they found out who, who cooked the specific dish, because there were French chefs, there were Italian chefs, there were different, different nationalities who, who came in. Uh, and then when they saw it was me, you know, you could really see from the faces of people that, you know, because of where I'm from, uh, it changed a bit. And again, of course, they're not going to be bluntly saying it. And I'm not saying that uh, all of them are like that, but some, some specific people. But I think I was, I was really blessed and lucky because uh, my mentors were there. And, you know, everybody would compare you from the previous chef and whatnot. So you really need to, I really need to go out of my comfort zone and, you know, cook, not just cook good food, run a restaurant for 150 seats, plus go out in the dining dining area, talk to guests and, you know, get that PR going. Um, so that kind of like worked for me. And, you know, I have a super team, you know, I had, a, I, had a, I had a really good, strong team behind me. I had a good restaurant manager because I couldn't run the whole restaurant just with me, right? I need to have a restaurant manager that works with me well, that bounces off ideas with me. So I opened my own restaurant uh, back in 2017 uh, in, in, in Dubai. Uh, it's not easy to open your own restaurant in Dubai. It, first of all, it's really expensive. Plus, you really need to know what you're doing. Um, a lot of people really supported me in that venture. Uh, but unfortunately, we just really couldn't cope up. I think what happened was we... I try to do everything by myself uh, and not really focusing on what I do best. Um, unfortunately, I, I, we folded. We had to close the restaurant. We couldn't sustain it anymore. And, you know, it was a really, it was the, opening my restaurant was the, the best and the worst uh, time of my life. Uh, because when I, when I opened it, it was, it was heaven. You know, you were in that stage. But when I closed it, it was also the worst time of my life. And it, it, I invested so much in it, you know, emotions, uh, finances and everything. And not a lot of people know the amount of work and, and, and drama that you face when you open your own restaurant, right? Just to take a pause on the whole story. I mean, being in this position right now, I've also failed. I've, I've failed a lot of times. I got hit a lot of times. Um, I, I lost uh, friends. I gained friends. Uh, I lost a lot of money. I, I earned a lot of money. I lost a lot of money. It's, it's, a, it's a roller coaster ride. Um, and uh, I think... Um, being a chef and being a part of being a chef is, is taking risks, um, especially when you're still, you know, when you're still young. I think this is the time to make uh, calculated mistakes, right? Um, so, yeah. So after that, after I closed my restaurant, I, I managed to get in touch with the Hilton Group again. Um, I have a lot of people who really supported me to, to stand back up. So my first uh, role in Hilton was to open the Waldorf Astoria, uh, a five-star luxury hotel in the financial district of Dubai. So I opened that as uh, the executive sous chef. Uh, and then just six months, after, uh, six months after opening, they tasked me to be an executive chef of three hotels, a cluster in the Al-Sif area of, um, of Dubai. And, you know, one year after, again, uh, Hilton gave me another opportunity. Um, they told me, John, uh, we're opening the biggest... Uh, one of the biggest resorts in, in Abu Dhabi, in the capital of the UAE. It's uh, Hilton Abu Dhabi As Island. It's a really big project. It's 541 rooms. Uh, you have a banqueting facility of 1,800. So are you up for the challenge? I said, you know, I was a bit scared, but you know what? Yalla, bring it over, right? So we took that challenge. And um, I think 
what I needed this time, and I'm I'm really happy, is that uh, I think I made the right decision hiring the people, hiring my team. I think uh, it was important to get the people to do the right jobs. Maybe just one advice. It's actually, I think, being a chef in general, I think you will succeed. You will just go far depending on how far you want to sacrifice time and uh, and how much work you want to put in, right? I mean, all of those successful chefs right now definitely dedicated a lot of time and effort into their craft. That's why they, they are where they are right now. But I just want to like make everybody understand that it's to get where you are, there's always consequences, right? It's not all glitz and glamour. It's not always uh, uh, he got lucky and he got a position. Oh, oh, he's he has his restaurant and you know it's it's all good. You know he he's good. Oh, he he has his own restaurant. He has a lot of money. You know it it doesn't work like that. I mean, and I'm pretty sure a lot of the seasoned chefs and the the entrepreneurs out there, and you know the chefs who've been through a lot also could could understand where I'm coming from because it's. Uh, it's really not easy, and this is the the hard true fact of it. Right? Yeah, I think I think that sums up uh, my very long speech. I think I went more than fifteen minutes. I want to wish uh, CCA Manila a happy twenty fifth anniversary, and uh, I wish that I will still be here when you reach the hundredth year anniversary. That would be cool. Um, I I wish I was there to celebrate the the milestone in uh, these accomplishments with you guys and uh, more power to to CCA Manila. I I'm, I'm sure that we have uh, developed and made a lot of really good chefs around the world and then we've actually populated the whole world with with uh, strong individuals and uh, re and really excelling as as professional chefs. So so well done CCA and uh, hope to develop more talents in the future. Thank you, Chef John. That was such a great, like, it just shows you, like, what a long journey it sometimes takes to get to where you are and all the hard work and dedication that's uh, gone, gone to, to it. it. Chef Philip, if, I, if you can ask you to join. And we'll go into the Q&A now. Um, yeah, it's really good to hear all these different perspectives, but I would encourage everyone in the room, about a hundred of us to ask questions because this is your chance to have like a one-on-one -on -one with these people who are always so busy. So Chef Jello, please come join um, the floor. I think Chef John, um, the ladies of Entrepreneurs, if it's, I think it's Grace and I'm not sure who's joining us. And Nicey as well, if you are there. Hi, Chef Jello. Hi, Chef John. How are you? Hi, Bea. And who do we have from Entrepreneurs? Uh, Grace? Oh, and... Yes, I've got my, my son's name on there. Let me just change oh, okay. it. <laughs> Hi, it's nice to finally meet you. It's weird to not see yes, you. Yes, you too. Yeah. So we'll, we'll jump into the questions and uh, maybe we can... Oh, Chef Philip, I think you're bursting with a question or something. <laughs> oh no! I'm just, I'm just listening. I mean, it's great to listen, right? With the questions. Yeah. Hey, um, of course, there's some real uh, familiar faces there. Um, I guess um, John was one of the. John was one of the. What, what year were you, John? In CCA must be seventeen, eighteen. Yeah, <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> I don't remember. So looking really good. Anyway, I mean, do you remember the earlier days of CCA? And I. It's great to hear. I mean, do you remember your, your faculty? Do you remember who yes. what was it like uh, first day it, in school? First day in school was, I think, it the, the bakery kitchen was still on the basement, I think. And it was, yeah, it was crazy. And there was the, yeah, it was just all the parking lot and the delivery trucks of cravings were there. And, you know, we would go next door to the carinderia and then order that longanista in the morning. I don't know if it's still there. But, uh, but that was good. And then after classes, we go to the meat shop across the road and then we go drinking. And, you know, so that was quite a long everyone's, time. Yeah, but it was... Chef John, everyone's smiling because I think Longanisa is something that everyone has either a really good memory um, about. But um, I'm curious, we have a question here for you and I, I'd like to ask everyone as well. What are your thoughts on Filipino fusion? I haven't heard it. I actually haven't heard fusion in a while. <laughs> what is everyone's thoughts on fusion? Is it is it for me or is it for for, for, for you first? But I think it will oh. ask everyone else. Um, yeah. 
Uh, okay. Um, I think I think fusion. I think we. Sh- Again, I don't know if I'm going to get shot for this, but I don't think we should focus on fusion for now. I think we should focus first on telling the world how good our cuisine is and really focusing on the raw on on the quality of English before we start to delve into fusionize our cuisine. Because I think internationally, but just speaking from my perspective here in in a different country, is that not a lot of people really still understands our cuisine and they still didn't don't know how how good it is, right? So and the moment we try to fusionize it, I think we're just um, making it a bit more complicated for people to understand what is Filipino cuisine. I think what we should, I think personally, again, uh, what we should do is to tone down and make our cuisine palatable to the international market and focusing on the ingredients rather than, because I think Filipino food, there's a lot of flavors inside sometimes that we don't know what they're eating anymore. I think we need to focus on the raw ingredient and what it is and then just showcase that. Anyway, just I don't know if you answered the question, but fusion cuisine, I think it's just a, mi- a mixture of two different cuisines uh, that that would go well. But again, I, I'm not in for that, at least for our cuisine first. I think mm-hmm. we need to like really boldly show what we can do first. Yeah. How about for you, Grace and Fides? Am I saying your name right, Grace? Yes. Okay. <laughs> cool. I was just double checking. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I think fusion shouldn't be deemed as a dirty word. I think naturally, Filipinas growing up in Australia, we're already a fusion identity in that respect. And so a lot of the times um, we are going to be forced to actually replace um, ingredients that aren't readily available in Australia to things that would typically be used in the Philippines. So for us, I think, um, I, yeah, we try not to use the word fusion, but at the same token, I think it just naturally comes in many of the dishes and events that we curate. Um, for example, when I do my bake sales, um, I, I want to introduce the concept of buto and how to make buto using a steamer. But at the same token, I don't think steamed cakes is something that is as, um, I guess, notable to most Australians. So what I would do is sort of embed it with maybe calamanse and poppy seeds and actually turn that steamed cake into something that is quite, um, I guess, known by uh, Australians. That is the lemon and poppy seed tea cake. But actually mm. use that as a catalyst to actually have the conversations to talk about what is Filipino food and mm. why does this version of Porto mean still make it Filipino, but it's just my take on it as a Filipino Australian. Yeah, I agree with that. I was going to say that too, Grace. Um, and I think the 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 we have so much abundant um, ingredients, fresh ingredients in Australia. So it's it's really our way of utilizing what we have um, to, I guess. Um, push forward our, our messaging and our narrative in a way that makes sense, that resonates with our audience, but also the introduction to those who aren't familiar with our cuisine um, as a way to invite them in. Chef Jello, for you, what are your thoughts on fusion and TikTok and um, content creation? Um, I think fusion food is a natural progression because um, like wherever you, wherever you go in the world, right, you, you always carry a bit of, uh, no, not really a bit, but a huge chunk of your um, native flavor and cuisine with you. And then, of course, with the availability of ingredients or the non-availability of ingredients and also um, the the palate of those who you live with, your community, you kind of tend to adapt to it, right? In as much as uh, we're talking about culture, in as much as we're talking about um, practices, same thing with food. We bring our heritage and then wherever we are in the world, we unconsciously um, fuse it with the local cuisine. And it's a natural progression. I think it's it has been happening ever since, since the Spaniards have, um, you know, conquered the Philippines for 300 years, um, the Chinese immigrants. Um, right now, all of these foods like our kikiam, our, our paella, our valenciana are all kind of fusion in terms of the way it's prepared, the, 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 the ingredients. So I think it's a natural progression that we shouldn't be bothered about because it's, it's it's the way of life yeah mm. thank you Jell- chef jello um nicey i'm curious about what do you think i mean with aura like does anyone ever ask you like you should make table as table or you know because your product is internationally known and it's a beautiful product but i'm sure it's some filipinos will be like you need to make this specific product 
when it comes to aura, uh, it's actually really honoring and really elevating the natural flavors that's coming from the Philippines. But at the same time, when Kelly mentioned that aura is very much open to collaborations, that in itself is fusion because we try to um, like see how chefs can also um, create different dishes and products using the aura as an ingredient. And at the same time, um, you know, fusion is, um, it's not, it's, it's something that really helps promote what the original ingredients are and also the, the culture. But at the same time, it's also helping more people kind of enjoy new things. And it's also in a way innovating the dishes that we have available because it shows that there's so much more that can be done as mentioned chocolate how it's not only for desserts or for baking it can also be used for for savory dishes and other um in, uh, as mentioned earlier yeah i have a personal question because we have talked a lot about your successes your accolades and a lot of things that you do well but uh with storytelling on food has there ever been a moment that it's failed for you? Like, you know, you tried this, this story or you tried this activity uh, and it didn't work exactly, uh, exactly as you hope. Um, and what did you learn from that? Anyone can answer first. I, I don't know if that's a hard question, but I always like hearing how people like learn from their failures. And we've heard so many amazing things already. I, I'm in our room of 100 plus, I want them to know that you will fail and you got to mm. pick it up after, not like get, not be like, oh, I'm not like Chef John or I'm not like entrepreneurs. I'm not perfect in all my execution. There's some not so great executions. Chef John, um, me, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Grace. Oh, I was going to say um, on the video that Fidesz had na narrated, there was a um, sort of snippet of our doodle fight or kamayan feast that we had 180 people come in purchase tickets and actually do it post the movie screening of ulam and um we did not anticipate it was going to be that many people and we did not anticipate that it would take that long to serve that many people and realize that people were actually quite hungry and quite sort of like you know getting they were hangry sort of they were hangry after hangry and waiting for those <laughs> items to come on out so i think you know our notion of bringing the community together was actually sort of superseding our logistical element of how it was going to sort of all pan out um but you know that was one of the things that we just learned from that lesson perhaps we have to really sort of factor in the numbers and also factor in the timing of the food and not just focus in on bringing the community together because ultimately they were there also to feast and to enjoy but um yeah mm -hmm. just really recognizing what we were capable of and the more is not always the merrier you need mm -hmm. to make sure that, um the people that do sort of pick up and purchase tickets from for your events are going to have a quality experience and not one where they leave angry because they weren't fed on time in, uh, and enough. Yeah. Can I just add to that as well? I mean, the notion of perfection, I think there's no such thing. Um, and I actually, you know, obviously failures, I mean, it's what your definition of failure if you're learning from, from your experiences. Um, and so for us, um, in my cuisine, a virtual cooking class, um, which obviously was born from... Um, COVID and, and the pandemic, everyone started sort of cooking at home. Um, but even for us seeing, you know, renowned chefs, you know, three-headed chefs um, in their own home, um, it's not a perfect sort of, you know, restaurant space it's it's their home it's that was really refreshing for me personally because it's you know it's it's real and that's the real world so I think um I think we're beyond sort of this perfection you know I think it's really very much about re what's real and what's um yeah that connection through home and food in a, in, in a very real way so yeah I just want to I just want to jump off from what Fides has mentioned about perfection because people would see, especially from cooking shows, right, and cooking competitions, that it's all perfect. It's all right. Oh, my God, they got it the first time. Um, but it's, it's a perception because even um, Michelin-starred chefs have actually gone through hours and hours of failure to come up with a perfect dish, yeah, right? Yeah. From a food content creator perspective, um, it's more forgiving because the audience won't be able to taste 
the, the final dish so I can just go ahead and taste it and say, mm-hmm. And you can edit but, it, Angelo. Right, and edit through it, right? But yeah. um, actually what CCA has taught me there is in CCA, we just don't teach you recipes. We teach you techniques, right? Mm-hmm. And in the time that we mess up, we know how to kind of salvage it, right? Like when you're cream curds or when, I don't know, like, when it's too, it has become a, bit, a tad too salty, then we have tools and techniques that we can use to salvage the food. Because again, one thing that's taught to us is food wastage is a no-no, oh, right? Yeah. So, so those things that we learned from CCA helped us in, in those failures. But at the end of the day, failures are only failures when you don't improve on them, right? And in, in the food content uh, world, um, the food content creation world um, where everything needs to be a bit glossy and it's a bit presentable, then that's just the, that's just the, the, the veneer of, of food surface. content creation. The surface. Yeah. But yes. like the mess that you do, um, that the food is getting cold because you have to shot angles. These are b- behind the scenes um, realities that we need to really that 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 are happening and um and oh, of course we we fail all the time we make mistakes all the time but the thing is do you know how to um improve on those and i think cca has taught us and has empowered us with tools and techniques on how to do those things and improve on those things okay i think i think i need to jump on on what angelo said because i think it's more of like jumping off each other's ideas right so <laughs> so going on failing a lot of times and like what i said i think um, a lot of like for sure there's a lot of researchers here as well i mean i personally think um i shouldn't call it failure i think i should call it uh, a learning step um i think you only fail when you don't try again and i think that um like personally speaking when i said when i closed my restaurant it was a passion project right i i took it so personally that to the point that it almost killed me literally when I closed down my restaurant. Um, but I think uh, the one that I think uh, is, is a recipe for, for failure is I think ego. I think chefs do have a lot of mm-hmm. ego, to be very frank, and chefs hate each other, unfortunately. <laughs> I don't know why, because someone cooks better than the other, but I think that's something I personally have learned the hard way. Mm-hmm. And you know, you just need to sometimes really accept that you don't know everything and you there's still continuous uh, growth and you just keep on trying right mm-hmm. um yeah mm-hmm. i think that's that sums up everything for, for me and yeah, the essence yeah. of cur- curiosity remain curious is yeah. just feeding yeah, exactly. that on um, lifelong learning i think and admitting that you don't know everything and that that and that then opens conversations around collaboration as well that's so right. yeah yeah so for yeah, for Aura, um, coming from the business development and sales side, it's actually, um, we experience a lot of challenges and in a way failures as well. Because for example, um, Aura is really a very young company and comparing to other chocolate companies that's like international brands well known, it's very challenging. I firsthand experienced it like pitching to chefs and to, to buyers, like why, why Aura? And they would say like, why are we going to choose you? Like there's a lot of important brands and you're local and you're expensive but um, we just learn from that we try to to change the strategy we try to change the approach and um, you know it's really in a way frustrating as well sometimes it it's kind mm-hmm. of brings us down when people um, internationally, like in Europe or in the US or other countries, like even in Tokyo, there's a, an aura store there, like people are recognizing aura, but here in the Philippines, it's kind of a challenge to really convince the shop to kind of like use aura as an ingredient, but it's slowly like really changing the past few years, but it's been challenging like from um, the, the, the launch in 2017, people are kind of hesitant to, to use aura, but it's, it's really changing, we're really great for those who who use the ingredients to support um, the brand and um, we just want to really promote um, local and also at the same time we want to continue um, sourcing the cacao from the farmers so that they can continue like here in the Philippines agriculture it's also something that's really um, you know dying in a way because not a lot of people would want to continue the agriculture or their farming industry so that's really um, the goal not just um, source how from Davo, but also or is uh, the team of or is 
uh, exploring other regions as well in sourcing the different how. So that's yeah. kind of the, the challenges that we've experienced on our side. Thank you mm-hmm. so much um, for all of you for being honest. Usually, you know, they would just give a vague answer about failures, but I think all of you were very specific that 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 is part of it. Um, and that a lot of people have much to learn from that. And hopefully people have picked up a few tips and tricks and I don't know, everything else, Chef Philip. Um, thank you so much, yeah. Yes, and I want to say thank you to uh, Chef John, Chef Jarlog, uh, Grace, Des as well, and Nicey for being just open and just sharing so much wealth of knowledge today. So we'll jump into a uh, quick awarding. May, if I can get you the floor just to give a... Uh, we love a token of appreciation in this school, so may go ahead. Sure, Ms. Daya. So allow me now to do the awarding of Certificates of Appreciation to all our guest um, speakers for um, this event. Okay, so the first one that we have is um, we would like to award this Certificate of Appreciation to Ms. Nicole Fonseca in grateful recognition for Invaluable contribution as a featured speaker in the day two virtual event of CCA Manila's 25th founding anniversary with a topic sustaining cravings for Filipino food. Given this 25th day of November 2021 via the Zoom digital platform, signed by CCA Manila's Chancellor for Education, Dr. Maria Veritas F. Luna, and CCA Manila CEO, Ms. Marinela G. Trinidad. Thank you so much, Ms. Nicole. The next Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to the MCP9. So we would like to thank Ms. Fidesz and Ms. Grace for joining us this morning. So we are awarding you the Certificate of Appreciation in grateful recognition for invaluable contribution as a featured speaker in the state two virtual event of CCA Manila's 25th founding anniversary with a topic, Storytelling Through Food, given this 25th day of November 2021 via the Zoom digital platform, once again signed by CCA Manila's Chancellor for Education, Dr. Maria Veritas F. Luna, and CCA Manila's um, CEO, Ms. Marinella G. Trinidad. We also would like to um, award the Certificate of Appreciation to Aura Chocolate. Of course, we would like to thank Ms. Naisi, um, for representing Aura Chocolate, and of course for Miss Kelly for dropping by earlier. The next certificate of appreciation is awarded to Chef John Marto Benaventura. And the last certificate of appreciation we would like this uh, we would like to award this to Chef Angelo Gison. Thank you so much to all our. So back to you, Ms. Bea and Chef Philip. Thank you, May, and thank you again to everyone that has joined us. Um, we'll just jump into the last couple of things. Um, go ahead, Chef Philip, and wrap us up. Okay, so um, do you want me to do the not the closing remarks yet? No, um, no, no. You... I don't want you to. No, leave no, no. Yet. Oh, but you know, not yet. So um, <laughs> just seeing... Oh yes, yes. Sorry, it's here. Okay. <laughs> I lost it. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. (laughs) It went wrong on this screen. That's okay. This is Zoom, right? Okay. So, okay. So, here I have um, for the participants to to fill in and give feedback. Before we jump into that, Chef Philip, um, we have a short yeah. video on the Filipino Culinary Arts Program, if, I can, if we can just show that. Um, again, oh, here we go. Yeah, sure. everyone here is an advocate of Filipino cuisine, and um, I'm hoping Enterprise and Chef John and Chef Jello and Nicey as well will help us along the way. Um, this is just a teaser on our upcoming program.
for that. Again, that's just a short, it's just a short teaser of what we have. And there's so much to unpack with Filipino cuisine. And I was very formal with the closing message, but Chef Philip, can I ask you just to say a few words to, um, to close this event? Chef Philip? Yeah, just give me a second here. So sorry, my notes. Um, just, can you hold on for a second there? Can you just talk for a second? Of while? course, of course. I think everyone, a hundred of us here are hungry after these talks. Next year, I'm really hoping we can do this face-to-face. -face. Um, it's been an amazing got thing. Got it. Yeah, you got it? Go ahead. Yeah, that's a thanks. Thanks for jumping in there. It's been a really long and interesting morning. So, you know, it's so inspiring to hear the great stories of these outstanding contributions from inspiring personalities in our industry, here in the Philippines and the impact of Filipino chefs, restaurateurs around the world. It is indeed a great time for the Philippines to shine, whether it be as an individual, a restaurant, a product, international competitions, or simply the warmth and hospitality of the Filipino, a trademark greatly needed and appreciated in our industry and definitely at these times. So raise your tea mugs, glasses, or coffee cups. Mm -hmm. Happy Thanksgiving to you all. Happy anniversary. CCA and congratulations to all of you for sharing this monumental occasion. Uh, long live CCA and have a great day. Flame on. Back to you, Beth. Thank you so much. Again, I just want to remind everyone that their last two days of CCA Manila's anniversary okay. celebration. Um, and please do register or invite your friends because at the end of it, you will have our amazing 25 recipes that from chefs that have just um, donated and shared their um, knowledge. So we have, next we have alumni cook-off and we have a culinary competition on day four. And then there's an alumni uh, gathering online and silver lining kit. And my hope is next year we will do these things face-to-face -face so that there will be food part of it as we've talked about it so much in these virtual events. So again, um, don't forget to sign the feedback form um, that we'll be sending on the chat box so you can get your a lot of the other activities in our kit. And then just a reminder for day three, we have Chef Miguel Razon from Melbourne, Chef Alan Briones in the Philippines um, in the peninsula. We have Chef Pauline Sarmento on, from the online classes and Chef Sunny Mariana, who I is like, you know, Dexter's laboratory really for food. It's just amazing guy. And these four are really people that you can learn from and ask questions. And lastly, please do follow us on social media because we like keeping in touch with you at CCA Manila on Facebook, Instagram, and all the rest. Um, again, thank you again for everyone that has stayed over time with us and happy 25th anniversary <laughs> to CCA. <laughs> we just love talking about food. So thanks, Chef Philip, for co-hosting. And thank, thank you, Bert. Dan, you. enjoy your lunch. Yes, we need Have lunch. a great happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> happy Thanksgiving, happy 25th and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you.